What's up folks, welcome to the part 7, of what if Deku become a healer hero, chapter 17. Who are you texting? Kakan grunts as they take the train to school a couple of days later. Since it's raining, the train is more crowded than usual, so the two boys are pressed together uncomfortably while Kakan futilely growls at anyone who gets too close. Without looking up from his phone, Izuku replies, Haru-kun. Kakan wrinkles his nose. You still talk to that guy? Only sometimes though. We're both kind of busy. Izuku glances at his friend. Don't you still talk to Tsubasa-kun or Inoue-kun? Why would I? Kakan raises an eyebrow and Izuku shakes his head with a sigh. Well, anyway, Haru-kun says congratulations on getting second place. Tell him to fuck off. Another sigh. Kakan excuse me, a voice suddenly whispers, Hey, Bakugou from the, hero class. Kakan and Izuku both blink in surprise and glance over at a man flashing the blonde a thumbs up. Good job at the sports festival. You were so close. Izuku winces when he hears his friend's teeth grind audibly behind him, but the stranger's whisper catches the attention of other passengers too. Oh, you're the one who got second place. You were so cool. You'll win next year. I'm positive. They mean well, they really do, Izuku can tell, but all they're doing is rubbing Kakan's loss in his face. The blonde starts to growl, but Izuku interrupts him by elbowing him sharply. Glancing over his shoulder, he meets Kakan's glare and counters it with a warning look that clearly says be nice. Kakan's jaw clenches. Then, through gritted teeth, he hisses, thanks, pleased. Izuku is about to turn back to his phone when a woman calls out, Oh, who's that green-haired boy with him? Isn't that the new healer? Oh, yeah, it is. Midraya, right? Startled by the sudden attention, Izuku flushes under the curious but friendly gazes of the other passengers. He supposes it makes sense that they would recognize him too, even if he didn't compete. Present Mick did, put him under the spotlight and the fact that he was the only student not wearing a training uniform coupled with the fact that healers are incredibly rare probably helped people remember him. The freckled boy smiles politely at their well wishes, but he can't help the sigh of relief that escapes him once they leave the train. Kakan snorts at his flustered state before propping his own umbrella, open. His usual check-in with recovery girl is brief and a little disappointing. He asks about Ingenium. But she says that there isn't much anyone can do for him. She sends him off early, and so when Izuku walks back to homeroom, he gets there the same time as Ida. They both stop when they see each other. Izuku's eyes roam over the taller boy. He looks. Surprisingly fine. Aside from the faintest, hint of dark circles under his eyes, he looks as neat and proper as usual. It baffles Izuku, but then Ida smiles and greets him. Good morning, Midraya-kun. You're here early. He tilts his head thoughtfully. Or do you meet with recovery girl San in the morning as well? I do, Izuku replies a bit hesitantly. He pauses, then asks, Er, Ida-kun, I was wondering if it's about my brother. Eden uncharacteristically interrupts, there's no need to worry. I apologize for calling you the other night, it was incredibly inappropriate for me to do so. Oh. Izuku blinks. Well, if you're sure I am. Ida smiles at him. But something about it feels forced. Let's go inside, shall we? Without another word, he leads the way into homeroom. Izuku stifles a sigh and follows him, taking his seat behind Kakan, who glances questioningly between him and Ida. Soon, everyone starts filing in and chatter excitedly about the sports festival. So many people talked to me on my way here. Ashido exclaims. Yeah, me too. Kirishima says. Bukigukun and I went out for ice cream the other day and people kept coming up to us while we were in line. You two went out for ice cream? Kaminari, raises an eyebrow. Together? Ashido perks up while Kakan snarls wordlessly at the blonde. Izuku makes eye contact with the pink girl and grins. She squeals. Their classmates continue to chat about their own experiences with their newfound fame until Aizawa slides open the door, 
causing everyone to scramble to their seats. The teacher silently trudges up to his desk before turning and fixing them all with a firm look. We're having a special hero informatics class today, he says promptly. Everyone tenses up. Code names. You'll be coming up with hero names. We're going to be doing something exciting. The whole class cheers, only to be silenced by a flash of red from Aizawa's eyes. The man goes on to further explain the pro hero draft picks he mentioned the other day, how it's uncommon for first years to receive offers and that they'll have to prove themselves during their internships. He then displays the list of nominations, and as Yuku isn't surprised to see that he has none. He makes a mental note to ask Recovery Girl what he's going to be doing for his own internship, if he even gets one. Totoraki, of course, has the most nominations. As Yuku glances over his shoulder, and casts him a supportive smile. Meanwhile, Kaken growls under his breath at once more being forced into second place by Totoraki, having around 600 fewer nominations. Keeping these results in mind, Aizawa says, whether or not anyone asked for you, you will all be participating in internships with Prowse. At USJ, you already got to experience combat with real villains, but it will still be meaningful training for you to see pros at work firsthand. The students glance at each other with smiles on their faces, murmuring in excitement. Saru looks at his Yuku and asks, Do you think you'll be doing an internship too? Yeah, what about Zuku? Kakin asks. Aizawa blinks, slow and tired. Midraya will also be participating in an internship. I will? His Yuku jumps in surprise, but I didn't get any nominations. Aizawa scratches his cheek kindly and grunts. I think I heard Recovery Girl mention something about introducing you to some other healers. I'm not quite sure what you'll be doing, though, so ask her. Is Yuku perks up? Meeting other healers? That'll be fun. So that explains the hero names, Sato says. Aizawa grumbles something about the names being temporary, then, retreats into his sleeping bag to let Midnight take over the name choosing process. The class immediately starts brainstorming for ideas, but Izuku finds himself hesitating. He hasn't thought about having a hero name in years, not since his quirk manifested. Before then, of course, he always imagined what his future name might be. They all ended up being variations of All Might. But that was back. When he could still dream about being a hero when he could still spend hours wondering what his life will be like and how cool his quirk will be and how he could become a hero like All Might. But now, he isn't even sure if he's supposed to be thinking of a hero name. After all, it's not like he's going to be a real hero. He's just a healer. I can't imagine why someone like All Might would go out of his way to sponsor someone who won't even be a real hero, Endeavor's voice snarls in his mind. Across from him, Saro plops his chin on his palm and sighs, Man, I'm stumped. I thought of a bunch of names when I was a kid, but now they just sound dumb. He glances at his Yuku. What about you, Midraya-kun? Any luck? His Yuku blinks in surprise as he's dragged out of his thoughts, then looks, down at his blank board. Oh, I don't really know. Am I supposed to think of a name? Saro tilts his head confused. Midnight hears from the front of the room and calls out, of course you need to think of a name, Midraya Kun. The pros need to know what to call you during your internship. Her loud voice catches the attention of his other classmates and his Yuku shrinks slightly, feeling, self-conscious. But I mean, this is hero stuff. He mumbles, I. I mean, I'm not. I'm just a healer, you know? Midnight blinks and she seems to take on a more serious tone when she says, Midraya Kun, I hope you realize that healers are considered heroes as well. Recovery Girl said something similar before when they first met, but when Izuku glances at the rest of his classmates, all of whom, are strong and fought so hard during the sports festival, he can't really find himself agreeing. His silence seems to make Midnight even more displeased. Midraya Kun. Why do you call our beloved nurse recovery girl-san instead of Chio-sensei? Izuku frowns in confusion, 
then his eyes widen in realization. He glances away sheepishly. Because it's her hero name? And what is her full title, is Yuku feels his face heating up slightly. The youthful heroine, recovery girl. That's right. Midnight smiles, her eyes twinkling with warmth. Because she is a hero. That woman has saved more lives than I can count, and I'm sure you will too someday. I don't know about you, but that counts as a hero in my books. Is Yuku ducks his head, trying to hide his burning cheeks. His classmates smile at, him reassuringly, and even Kakin sends a sharp kick to his shins, as if to scold him for thinking something so stupid in the first place. I... I guess I don't know what to pick for myself, then, he admits, I've never really thought about this before. Kaminari perks up and suggests, you should be recovery boy. It's stupid and it makes everyone groan, but his Yuku can't help the snort of laughter, that escapes him. In the end, he doesn't manage to think of a name before class ends, but Midnight is forgiving and allows him to have extra time to come up with one. The rest of the school day is fairly uneventful, except for lunchtime. Izuku wants to let Totoraki join their group, since he has a suspicion that the boy usually eats alone, but Kakin snarls and complains when he suggests it. He, compromises by quickly getting one of the, big tables for them one that they can't fill up with their usual because quent, as Ashido has dubbed it. So, he waves Totoraki over, and to his surprise Yerazu and Jiru come along with him. Soon, they're also joined by Yuraraka and Ida. Izuku beams as he successfully sits between the two groups, ignoring Kakin's growl as he talks to Totoraki. The conversation about internships continues, everyone, minus Izuku received a list of agencies to choose from, even those who didn't get any nominations. I've already decided, Yuraraka announces, I'm going to battle Hero, Gunhead's agency. Huh? Izuku exclaims, Gunhead's a huge battle type. You're going there, Yuraraka-kun? Yup. I got an offer from them. Yuraraka says, smiling determinedly as she throws a fake punch. Didn't you say? You wanted to become a hero like 13? Yerazu asks, you seemed really excited to meet them at USJ. Ultimately, yes, Yuraraka replies, but fighting Bukigukun at the sports festival made me think the stronger I get, the more possibilities I'll have. If I only do what I want, I'll have a narrower perspective. Kakin, who has been stubbornly pretending to not pay attention to them, suddenly sneers loudly. You're still gonna get your ass kicked, round face. Your Araka smiles sweetly and promptly flips him off. Yerazu's cheeks turn pink while Jiru and Izuku burst out laughing. Kirishima has to hold Kakin back from launching himself across the table and pouncing on your Araka. As Izuku laughs, he can't help but notice that Ida is being strangely quiet. It's shocking that he, didn't scold your Araka for her rude gesture, but the blue-haired boy is silently staring down at his mostly untouched Mio with a faraway look in his eyes. Is Yuku's heart aches. Er, anyway. He tears his gaze away from Ida, forcing a smile on his face. Now I'm wondering if I should try to go somewhere that will increase my fighting skills. It might be helpful if I decide to join a rescue agency. MMM, but didn't Tezawa sensei say that you're gonna do something with other healers? Yuraraka asks. I wonder if healers have their own agencies? Jiru says. Izuku shakes his head. Probably not. I'll have to talk to Recovery Girl San about it after school. He turns to Totoraki with a small smile and asks, What about you, Totoraki-kun? Decided on a place yet? The boy hums. My father's agency, nominated me, he says, his voice blank, I think I'll go there. Izuku freezes while the girls smile and give encouraging comments. Totoraki meets his gaze and says in a much quieter voice, I thought I'd learn what I can from him. Izuku. Doesn't quite know how he feels about this, but he trusts Totoraki's newfound resolve to become his ideal hero, so he simply nods and tries to look supportive. At the end of the day, as Kakin and Izuku are leaving the classroom, Kirishima trots up to them and asks to walk to the train station with them. Oh, 
Sorry, Garishima kun, is Yuku apologizes, I meet with recovery girl San after school, remember? Oh, right, I forgot. The redhead turns to Kakin. What about you, Bakigu kun? I walk him home afterwards, Kakin grunts. Garishima cocks his head to the side. Do you wait by yourself the entire time? Kakin shrugs in response but is Yuku not? Garishima grins. Don't worry, bro, I'll wait with you. Huh? Kakin looks puzzled. I don't mind, I like hanging out with you, he chirps. Kakin stares at him like he's gone crazy. Hey, let's go train in the gym. I want a rematch for the sports festival. Izuku nudges his friend, encouragingly and Kakin shakes himself out of his stupor, a savage grin forming on his face. You're on, shitty hair. Glancing at Izuku, he adds, text me when you're done. Izuku waves him off and smiles as he watches them leave, proud that his stubborn childhood friend has made a friend of his own. He's still smiling when he walks into the infirmary for his lesson. After their usual business, of going over the day's patience, Recovery Girl finally tells him about his internship. As I'm sure Aizawa-kun told you, hero agencies are only allowed to nominate one student each, so they have to choose wisely, she explains, but just because they chose your classmates over you doesn't mean that nobody was interested in you. I thought I might have to pull a few strings, but actually I got a lot of calls from healers that I know asking if they could mentor you for your internship week. Izuku's heart flutters and he smiles. So, I hope you don't mind, but I went ahead and chose someone for you. Her name is Kami Yuki, aka Vapor Mend, and she's a very good colleague of mine. I've worked with her on and off throughout the years and I trust that she will give you a good insight into the world of hero healers. Vapor Mend. Izuku says, I've never heard of her. What agency does she work at? Well, since they're in such high demand, healers don't often stick to just one agency, Recovery Girl says, Kami Kun primarily works at Endeavor's hero agency but often travels to other agencies that reside in the same area, like the Ruka hero agency. You'll be shadowing her during your internship week and, since she's also a combat medic, you'll get to explore more of that field for yourself. I know you're still figuring out exactly what you want to do with your future. Is Yuku not, trying not to fidget eagerly. He gets to follow around a combat medic for a whole week? Going to multiple hero agencies? So cool. Okay. His voice squeaks a bit and recovery girl's eyes twinkle with, mirth at his obvious excitement. I don't know exactly where you'll be meeting up with her yet, but we can work out the details later, she says, then leans back in her chair and arches an eyebrow. So. I believe I heard from Kayama-kun that you had trouble coming up with a hero name today? Izuku freezes. Uh. How how much did she tell you, exactly? Recovery girl gives him an unimpressed look, and he cringes. He supposes he deserves the 20 minute lecture about the importance of healers to the hero society and yes Madriya-kun healers are heroes to you dolt that comes afterwards. What about something that refers to York work? Kirishima suggests as they walk to the train station later, what was it called again? Healing energy? Is Yuku not? So, how about that? Kakin wrinkles, his nose. The healing hero, healing energy? Sounds fucking weird. Is Yuku hums in agreement, patting Kirishima reassuringly when the redhead shoulders droop. Don't worry, it was a good idea. I mean, relating it to my quirk and all. I can't believe she didn't like my name, Kakin says. Izuku gives him a deadpan look. And I can't believe you actually thought she would. King Explosion, Murder is a fucking great name. The blonde snaps, that bitch has no taste. Kirishima snickers, a great name for a video game character maybe, but way too violent for a pro hero. You wanna die, shitty hair? Izuku is about to stop Kakin from lunging at Kirishima. But the latter easily defends himself from the blonde's explosions by making his arms hard. Anyway, he says casually, as if he wasn't just attacked, I'm more worried about the internships. I'm torn between Fourth Kind's agency and Swift Wanders. 
Kakan returns to Izuku's side with a huff while the Greenhead thinks. I think fourth kind would be better, considering your quirk. What about you, Kakan? He looks at his childhood friend, who smirks and flaunts his long list of recommendations. Of course I know, where I'm going. He boasts, I got nominated by best genist. Kirishima's eyes widen. Whoa, the number four hero? Lucky. Kakin tilts his chin up smugly. Then, he pauses and glances back down at the list. Wait a minute. He frowns. You said that healer chick you are gonna follow around works at Endeavor's place, right? Yeah, Izuku says. That's too far from best genist. Red eyes roam, over the list. His brows furrow even deeper. None of these fucking agencies are anywhere near where you will be. Izuku rolls his eyes, already knowing where he's going with this. Don't worry, Kakan, I'll be fine. What's he worried about? Kirishima asks. Sighing exasperatedly, Izuku turns to the redhead and says, Kakan's convinced himself that he needs to be my personal bodyguard at all times. Even though I will literally be surrounded by heroes the entire time. He gives Kakan a pointed look, but the other boy merely curls his lip wordlessly. Thankfully, Kirishima seems to agree with him. Ah, he'll be fine, Bakugukun. He's a tough little healer, isn't he? Grinning, he ruffles Izuku's curls good-naturedly. Remember when he kicked Totoraki-kun's ass during raining? Half, on half wasn't using his quirk, Kakan grumbles, but when Izuku narrows his eyes at him, he sighs loudly, but fine, whatever. Just be sure to fucking text me, alright? It's as good as he's going to get with Kakan. Izuku smiles, not noticing the way Kirishima glances between the two of them curiously. The next day goes by quickly. Lunch goes about the same way, with the Bakuz Quad sitting on one end while Izuku's other friends sit on the other end. It's nice not that Izuku doesn't like hanging out with Kakan, Kirishima, Sero, Ashido, and Kaminari, but it's fun to get to know his other classmates better. Yerazu is eager to give him tips and recipes when she learns of his quirk's connection to food, which is similar to her own. They have a stealth-based hero class that afternoon. And once school is over, Izuku helps recovery girl treat a handful of students. She gives him a bit more homework than usual, trying to prepare him as best as she can for the internship week, but he's more concerned about his difficulty controlling his quirk. He's hardly made any progress and, despite his mentor's insistence on patience, he finds himself becoming frustrated. Oi, Midraya kun What's with the frowny face? Yoraraka asks, dragging him out of his thoughts. It's the last day before the weekend and they're currently eating lunch in the cafeteria. Oh, it's nothing. He starts to say dismissively, but as he looks up at her, a flash of blonde catches his attention. He glances over, spotting Mirio walking with Hado and Umijiki, all with trays in their hands and obviously looking for a table. An idea forms in, his mind. Uh, excuse me, he says, grabbing his tray and standing up. His friends blink in surprise. Where are you going? Yerazu asks. Across the table, Kakin notices his movement and frowns in confusion. Izuka waves them off reassuringly as he awkwardly slides past Totoraki. I just remembered that I've been meaning to talk to someone. I'll see you guys later, okay? Midraya kun. Totoraki starts, but Izuku is already shuffling away. Don't wait up for me. He calls over his shoulder, making his way across the cafeteria with his tray in his hands. Mirio, Hado, and Majiki have found a table at this point and are sitting down. As Izuku approaches them, he finds himself getting increasingly nervous. Just talking to upperclassmen makes his heart pound, but now he wants to eat lunch with them? What is he thinking? But no no, he can't back down now. This is a good idea. It could really help him, he can't let his anxiety get in the way. Besides, what's the worst that could happen? It's not like they'll be outright mean to him. Forcibly swallowing down his anxiety, Izuku determinedly walks over to the upperclassmen and stops in front of their table. Um, 
Hi guys, Ku hi. Mirio shouts as soon as he looks up at him. The blonde gives him a blinding grin and his Yuku feels his cheeks heat up slightly. Shit, wait, never mind, this was a terrible idea, abort 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 Mido-chan. Hado's grin is just as dazzling as Mirio's. Where have you been, cutie? Come sit with us. Her comment makes his cheeks burn even more. Well, at least she saved him from having to, ask. If you don't mind. Nonsense. Miru says, scooting over to make space for him. A Majiki grunts when his friend presses against him and squirms away. Izuku nervously sits down and Mirio immediately plops a muscular arm around his shoulders. How are you doing, Midraya-kun? Oh, uh, I'm fine, Izuku says, not quite sure how to ask what he wants to ask. Hado puts her chin in her hands as she, leans against the table. What are the first years up to now? Both she and Miru gaze at him as if he's the most curious thing they've ever laid eyes on. Izuku tries to force his flush away and replies in a meek voice, uh, mostly just getting ready for our internships. Mirio makes a noise. So are we. It'll be your first time, right? What am I saying, of course it is. Hado sighs with a wistful, look in her eyes. Ah, I remember my first internship. How wonderful it must be to be young and carefree. Izuku stifles a snort, but Mirio doesn't bother letting out a loud bark of laughter. Hado smirks before perking up. Oh, you guys must have chosen your hero names then. Oh, right. What's yours, Midraya-kun? Mirio asks. Izuku gulps. Hey actually, I've been having some trouble picking mine, curiosity tickles his mind and he asks, what are your hero names? Mirio puffs up his chest proudly and announces, I will be the hero Lemillion. He grins at Izuku and explains, because I want to save at least one million people. He sounds so positive and confident that Izuku wholeheartedly believes that he will achieve that goal. Izuku smiles and glances at Hado, who wraps a curl around each, of her pointer fingers and says, Mine's Nejire-chan. Izuku blinks. Your own name? He recalls Totoraki and Ida choosing their given names too but he thought someone as bubbly as Hado would choose something more creative. Still, the girl seems proud of her choice, and a gentle squeeze of his shoulders has his attention turning back to Mirio. Your name can be whatever you want it to be. Really. Just make sure you choose something you won't regret later. He laughs and glances at Amajiki, who is watching them with his head ducked. You could also have it relate to your quirk. Tamaki-kun's hero name is Suniter. At the sight of Izuku's confused expression, Mirio explains, his quirk is called Manifest, he can manifest the physical characteristics of anything he eats. You see that, Takoyaki he's eating right now? Well, during class he'll be transforming his fingers into octopus tentacles. Amajiki turns his face away as the tips of his ears flush. Izuku doesn't understand why he seems so embarrassed that's such a useful quirk. That's really cool, Amajiki-kun. The raven-haired boy somehow shrinks even further into himself. Thanks, he mumbles, barely audible. Actually, now that I think about it, Izuku says, looking at the other two upclassmen, I don't really know much about your quirks either. He sees his chance it's a good transition to the topic that he came here to discuss. He smiles and listens politely as Mirio explains his permeation quirk which is super cool, but he's a lot more interested in Hana when she talks about her wave motion quirk. Much like him, she has the ability to convert her own stamina into energy and release it, but hers gets discharged in the form of powerful spiral shockwaves. That's really cool, he says and the girl preens. After a moment, he hesitantly adds, actually, one of the reasons I wanted to eat lunch with you guys today is to talk about your quirk. Oh? Hado tilts her head curiously. Yeah. His shoulders, scrunch slightly. I've, uh. Well, I don't really have that much control over my quirk. I usually just let it do its thing when I was younger because all I was healing was small injuries like scrapes and bruises, 
But one time I tried to heal something really big and I kind of totally exhausted myself and ended up in a coma for a couple of days. He scratches the back of his head sheepishly while the upperclassmen's eyes widen in alarm. Anyway, I just thought. Maybe, since our quirks are kind of similar. I thought that maybe you could teach you how to control it? Hado interrupts, practically throwing herself across the table to reach out and grab his cheeks. Of course I will. But. She grins almost manically. Only if you call me senpai. Mirio squawks while Liz Yuku blinks, his face, squished between Hado's palms. Oh. Okay. He squeaks. Her grin widens and she releases him. As he gingerly rubs his cheeks, she asks, So, what have you been having trouble with the most? Er, well, Recovery Girl San gave me a list of things to work on, but right now I'm just trying to focus on controlling the output, he says, my quirk activates automatically once I make skin contact and it won't stop until the wound is healed. So, even if I realize that I'm draining my energy, my body physically won't let me stop until it's over. Which is why it can be dangerous for me. Hado nods, looking surprisingly serious. And your energy what does it feel like? Is Yuku ponders about it. Kind of like. Tingly and warm? Like. Like energy, he stammers lamely. Um, and when it's leaving me it's, like a flow that I can't touch or grab onto no matter what. Aha. Hado perks up. See, that's your problem right there. You can't control your energy by touching it. Instead of focusing on the energy itself, focus on where it leaves your body. Huh? Izuku frowns, then glances down. Like, my hands? Sure. She chirps, you've gotta put all your concentration there to control the flow. Izuku, is a bit hesitant. I don't know. I can't really move my hands at all once my quirk's activated no, 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 it's not about moving your hands. Hado taps her fingers to her lips, humming in thought, then says, I like to think of it like a hose. You can stop the flow, or at least slow it down, by stepping on the hose. Just concentrate on the spot where your energy leaves and she makes a, closing gesture with her hands, narrow it down until it cuts off. Is Yuku considers it. It's kind of hard to visualize what she's saying, but maybe that's because he's always been so focused on trying to grab his energy instead of looking at the output. He isn't sure about this whole hose analogy, but it's a more solid idea than anything he's ever come up with. It'll at least be worth a shot, sorry if it sounds a bit confusing, Hado says when he's quiet for too long, I've never really had to think about it so hard before. It makes more sense in my head no, no, it's fine. That was really helpful, actually. He smiles at her. Thanks, Hado senpai. She gasps, eyes practically sparkling. A moment later, she's squeezing his cheeks again and her face is suddenly way too close to his. Call me Nejire senpai and I will love you forever. Is Yuku blinks. Next to him. Mirio is laughing loudly while Imajiki lets out a faint groan. He looks like he pities his Yuku. Um. The freckled boy isn't quite sure what to do. Okay, Najire senpai. Najire lets out an ear-piercing squeal and throws her arms around him in a tight hug. It's awkward and uncomfortable since they're hugging from across the table, but that doesn't stop her from cooing. Oh my god you're just too adorable. Mirio kun can we keep him? Please? Mirio just laughs louder while as Yuku's sweat drops nervously. Keep him? Thankfully, at the end of lunch, Mirio prevents him from being taken hostage. The trio waves at him as he walks back to his friends, Najire calling out, If you ever need help again, just come to your trusty senpai. Or if you ever wanna hang out. Mirio adds, a Majiki just gives him what he assumes is a poor attempt at a friendly smile before walking away with his shoulders hunched. After saying goodbye for about the twentieth time, Mirio and Nejire follow him. Izuku turns away with a small huff of laughter. Even though his new senpais are a bit overwhelming, he found himself having a fun time, while eating lunch with, them. 
They talked about the sports festival which Mirio won in the third year's stage and the blonde asked about his Yuku's classes with All Might. They're friendly and easy to get along with, and even though they did most of the talking they made sure to include his Yuku in their conversation. He tells Kakin about them on their way back to homeroom, but his friend just grunts about how it's weird, for first years to eat lunch with third years. Izuku sticks his tongue out at him in response. During their hero lesson, All Might asks if they've all chosen what agency they'll be going to for their internships. Everyone agrees, including Izuku, which incites more than a few surprised glances. Really, Midraya chan Asui tilts her head. I thought you said healers didn't have agencies? Jiru, asks. They don't, Izuku explains, but I'm going to be shadowing a combat medic named Vapor Man throughout the week. Since healers are in high demand, she isn't exclusive to one agency, so she kind of just goes where she's needed. I'll be meeting up with her at the Night Eye Agency and I guess we'll just go from there. He smiles, unable to hide his excitement. Recovery Girl gave him the rundown, of what to expect during his internship week just this morning. From what Vaporman told her, apparently they'll be spending a good few days at the Endeavor Agency, but Izuku doesn't want to tell Totoraki yet. He wants it to be a surprise, and it will no doubt be funny to see the look on Totoraki's face when he shows up. Hey, that's pretty cool, Midraya-kun. Sato says. Hagakure's sleeves jump, around. You get to go to multiple agencies? Lucky. Izuku laughs, but then he notices the way All Might is staring at him with slightly wide eyes. He almost looks panicked. As soon as their gazes meet, however, the number one hero gives himself a shake and plasters on his usual smile. Alright then, young zygotes. You want to make a good impression during your internships, so let's get to work. Recovery Girl 402 PM Sorry. I'm going to be a bit late for our lesson. Hold the fort until I get back. Midraya 404 PM, OK. Pocketing his phone, Izuku steps into the infirmary, letting out a small sigh of relief when he sees that it's empty. No students waiting to be treated. Normally he might jump at a chance to use his quirk, especially after what an edgire suggested to him, but today's hero lesson has left him rather tired. He trudges over to Recovery Girl's desk, intent on getting a head start on reviewing the day's list of patients, when a knock on the door has him faltering. He stifles a noise of annoyance and calls out, come in. To his surprise, instead of an injured student, All Might walks in. He's still in his muscled form and his costume from today's lesson. Hello, young Madraya, he greets, gently shutting the door behind him. Oh, hi, All Might. Izuku says, eyes roaming over him in concern. Are you alright? Yes, yes, I'm fine. He raises his arms and gestures to himself. No new injuries, no need to worry. I just wanted to have a word with you about your internship. Oh. Izuku relaxes and sits down in his desk chair. Sure, what's up? All Might, stiffly sits down on the nearest bed and shuffles his feet. He opens his mouth then closes it and shifts uncomfortably. If Izuku didn't know any better, he'd say All Might looks awkward. Well, it's mostly about the first agency you're going to, he finally says, you mentioned the Night Eye Agency? Izuku nods. He doesn't really know that particular hero too well, but from the look on All Might's face, he can't tell there's something bigger going on here. The blonde coughs, thankfully without any blood and says, ah, yes, well, you probably don't know this, but Sir Knight I used to be a sidekick of mine. Izuku's eyes widen. You had a sidekick? He exclaims, but but I thought you were always against taking on sidekicks. I was, All Might says, but Knight I was very persistent. Izuku's shocked expression doesn't change, and All Might eventually adds reluctantly, and he did all of my file work. So it was hard to say no. Izuku is stunned. How did he not know that All Might had a sidekick? He feels like such a fake fan. He and I worked together for many years, until my injury. All Might hesitates. As I'm sure you know, my injury was very 
severe. I almost died, and, seeing as the usage of my quirk was suddenly very limited, Sir Knight I wanted me to retire. Obviously, I refused and, well, we broke up. He grimaces and looks down at the ground. Is Yuku can't help but think he looks rather regretful. I've been meaning to call him, to tell him about meeting you and my newfound health, but. He glances away. I'm not sure if it will change anything. Is Yuku frowns, in confusion. Of course it would change things. Sir Knight I wouldn't have to worry anymore. But from the troubled look in All Might's eyes, he can tell there's a lot he still doesn't know about this whole situation. Maybe their breakup was uglier than All Might made it sound. So as Yuku holds his tongue. Instead, he asks softly, do you want me to say anything to him? All Might smiles and waves him off. Oh, no, no, don't you worry about it. I guess I just, I dunno, wanted to mention it. He pauses, gazing at his Yuka for a moment, then his smile wavers slightly. A soft sigh escapes his lips. Just. Well, if you see him. Let me know how he's doing. Izuku doesn't like how sad All Might looks right now. He doesn't outwardly show it, of course, but Izuku can see it anyways. He wonders just, how deep and personal his relationship with Sir Knight I was. Losing him must have hurt a lot, if it could leave such a heavy, lingering sadness in All Might's eyes. Yeah. He's definitely going to try and get those two back together. Smiling brightly, he nods and says, Okay. All Might huffs fondly and reaches out to ruffle his curls. Is Yuku, as usual, whines in protest, but something in the corner of his eye catches his attention. Mirio's face is sticking through the door. Is Yuku freezes. The blonde blinks at the hand on Is Yuku's head and glances between him and All Might curiously. Mirio senpai. Is Yuku squeaks. All Might glances over and retracts his hand. Ah, uh, sorry, Midraya kun. Mirio says, I was just looking for Haya kun. She got a little injured during class today and said she'd visit the nurse's office after school. Haya kun. Is Yuku vaguely recalls a pink haired upperclassman sitting next to Nejire during lunch. He healed her after the stampede, right? A friend of Nejire. And apparently Mirio? Sorry, I haven't seen her. He gets up and looks over Recovery Girl's clipboard once more. Looks like she hasn't stopped by today. Alrighty, then. I've to gonna go find her, Mirio laughs boisterously. Izuku is confused, but then All Might laughs too. Mirio looks thrilled that the number one hero found whatever he said to be humorous. See you later. He chirps before his face retreats. All Might is still chuckling. What a funny young man. Is Yuku blinks. Then, his eyes widen in realization. Oh. To get a go. Like his name, but he has to oh. He looks at All Might, that was a joke. Not a very funny one, in his opinion, but he's not surprised that All Might would laugh at something as stupid as that. Took you a little while there, the older man teases. Is Yuku huffs, then pauses. Wait, you know his name? I thought you didn't teach third years? All Might stiffens, so fleeting that his Yuku wouldn't have noticed if he didn't know the man so well, then casually, brushes it off. Oh, I've just heard his name go around campus he's a popular one, you know? Apparently, there's almost always laughter echoing around him. It's believable, but his Yuku is still a bit suspicious about the way he tensed up there. Actually, Throughout their whole conversation he got the faint feeling that All Might wasn't quite telling him everything. But Izuku knows that he wouldn't keep anything too important from him, so he supposes it's none of his business to know. Still, he can't help but wonder why All Might would know Mirio's name and recognize him. The two do look rather similar, too. Smirking slightly, he asks, are you sure he's not your secret love child or something? He's teasing, of course but he immediately regrets it when All Might chokes and spews blood in, shock. Oh shit, sorry, sorry my my boy gak exclamation mark what on earth? Ah, here's a handkerchief. Do you need another one? Shit dear lord, you can't just say things like that. 
What goes on in your mind? Sorry. Chapter 18. Despite Izuku's excitement for his internship week, the day they're meant to be sent off also brings a sense of unease. Yuraraka texts him early that morning, expressing her worry about Ida doing his internship with a lesser known agency in Hazu. The city where his older brother essentially lost his life as a hero. He won't have any friends to distract him from his pain, and Izuku worries how this week long internship might affect him. So, when Class 1A meets up at the train station, Izuku and Uraraka approach Ida. The blue haired boy turns when Izuku calls his name, but the greenette suddenly finds that he doesn't quite know what to say. What can he say in this situation? He has no idea what's going on in Ida's mind right now. Thankfully, Uraraka knows Ida better than he does, so she steps forward. If, if you ever need to talk to someone, you have our numbers. You know you can talk to us about anything. We're your friends, right? Izuku asks. There's a pause, then Ida turns to them. Even though he's smiling, his face is closed off. Yeah, he says, then turns and walks away without another word. Yuraraka sighs and looks at Izuku. I suppose there isn't really much else we can do for him. Izuku reluctantly nods. They can't really help Ida if he doesn't want them to. He hopes that just the reminder of their support will be enough for the other boy, but that doesn't stop anxiety from churning in his stomach as he bids goodbye to Uraraka and returns to Kakin's side. Remember to text me when you get there, the blonde reminds him for the hundredth time as they walk to Izuku's platform, and don't fucking talk to creeps along the way. Izuku rolls his eyes. Yes, mother. Ignoring Kakin's growl, he spots Totoraki and waves as they pass by. Totoraki simply, gives him a small smile in return. Soon, Izuku is sitting on the train, gazing out the window as the scenery flashes by. It's really weird to be traveling by himself for the first time. It's weird that the person sitting next to him isn't Kakin, but a complete stranger. It makes him nervous, but he mentally scolds himself for being so cowardly and tries to force himself to be excited instead, he gets to go somewhere without Kakin. He gets to have an adventure that's all his own. This is new and exciting and he's going to make the best of it. So, with that positive mentality, he plasters a smile on his face and eagerly anticipates his arrival. The night eye agency is about an hour long train ride from up but it feels like it passes in minutes. Before he knows it, he's standing on the sidewalk, peering up at the large, five story building in front of him. His smile wavers ever so slightly. Despite his mental pep talk, his anxiety returns with full force. He's really alone right now. Kakin usually takes the lead with this kind of stuff. Actually, he takes the lead with pretty much everything. Izuku's so used to being a follower that he isn't quite sure how to proceed. What if, he's super awkward and makes a fool of himself? What if he does something wrong and messes everything up? What if through the glass doors, he can see a receptionist inside giving him an odd look? Oh shit, he's been standing outside for way too long. Stepping inside, he smiles politely and walks up to her desk. X excuse me, he tries not to stammer, um, I'm here for my internship. With with, Kamiyuki. The receptionist glances at her computer screen and makes a noise. Ah, uh, are you Madraya Izuku? Izuku nods, mentally scolding himself for not giving his name right away and she gestures to the staircase. She should be on the third floor. I'll let her know you're coming. Izuku thanks her and nervously makes his way up the staircase, which is shaped in a dizzying spiral. Everything, around him seems so pristine and fancy, it makes him feel very out of place. He gazes around in awe he's in a real hero agency. He's so busy gawking at everything that he completely loses count of how many floors he's gone up. Shit. Did he already pass the third floor? No, no, it's the one just above him this one. Coming to a stop at the next landing, Izuku spots a plain looking door at the end, of the long hallway. There's no sign or any hint as to what might lay behind it, so he cautiously moves closer and opens the door slowly. 
The first thing he notices is the abundance of All Might merchandise spread out across the room. Posters are plastered on every wall, All Might bobbleheads and knickknacks carefully placed in already full bookshelves and desks, a life-size All Might cardboard. Cutout propped up in the corner. Is Yuku freezes. What did he just walk into? Is this whole room a shrine? Whatever this place is, he's not the only one here. A young woman with blue skin and hair notices him as soon as the door opens and straightens up. Who are you? She asks. Is Yuku startles and opens his mouth to reply when suddenly a large body flies out from one of the walls. Except, the wall, remains unbroken, as if the body phased through it. The person hits the ground with the loud thump right in front of his Yuku. He immediately recognizes who it is. Me Mirio Senpai? He squeaks. Mirio glances at him in surprise, sitting up, and wow that's a lot more skin than his Yuku's used to seeing. His face heats up and he slaps his hands over his eyes. You you were naked. Huh? Mirio looks down at, himself, as if he didn't even notice. Oh, right. Sorry. Sometimes I lose my clothes when I phase through something with my whole body. Izuku keeps his eyes covered as he hears Mirio get up. The woman from earlier sighs and walks over, asking, Why did you phase through the wall, then? I thought I might break it. Sir would be upset if I destroyed his Bronze Age poster. Izuku peeks between his fingers long enough to see Mirio nod at a poster on the wall featuring All Might and said Bronze Age costume. Mirio himself is unabashedly standing with his hands on his hips, his broad, naked chest glistening with sweat. Izuku blushes furiously, sparing a quick glance down and letting out a sigh of relief when he sees that Mirio has covered his nether regions with a jacket, probably given to him, by the woman. Mirio looks at him with a grin. Anyway, I didn't expect to see you here, my little Kuhai. You know this kid? The woman asks. Izuku opens his mouth to introduce himself, only to be interrupted by a door opening on the same wall that Mirio phased through. A tall man, who Izuku instantly recognizes as Sir Naitai he may have done some research after All Might mentioned him walks, in. Mirio, what did I tell you about he pauses when his eyes land on Izuku. The freckled boy gulps, suddenly finding himself under an intense gaze. Who are you? Naitai demands. Izuku once again opens his mouth, but Mirio beats him to it. The blonde wraps a heavy arm around his shoulders, pulls him close to his side, and announces, This is my Kuhai, Midraya Izuku of Class 1A. A hero, student? Naitai's golden eyes narrow. I didn't hire another intern. What are you doing here? Oh, yeah, what are you doing here, Midraya-kun? Mirio glances down at him curiously. Izuku's face burns, mostly likely due to the fact that, despite the jacket, Mirio is still very much naked and is pressing the smaller boy against him. As he squirms out of his grasp, he stammers, Uh, I'm doing my internship with Kamiyuki. Er vapor mend. Ah, right, she mentioned someone would be coming by, the blue skinned woman says, Your recovery girl's apprentice? Right? Izuku nods and she smiles. It's nice to meet you then, Midraya kun. I'm Bubble Girl, Sir Naitai's sidekick. She holds her hand out and Izuku takes it. Nice to meet you. Hey, you never told me you'd be coming here for your internship. Mirio says, his words accusing but his tone good natured. He reaches out to ruffle Izuku's curls but the green it hastily dodges. He'd put his hair in a very nice bun today and he doesn't want it to be ruined. I'm not really staying here, I don't think, he says, Vapor Men San goes where she's needed, so I'll just be shadowing her. You get to go to multiple agencies? Dang. It's cool that healers have such flexibility. Mirio says. I'm jealous. There are so few of them around, Bubble Girl comments, it's nice to see such a young healer. Before Izuku can reply, Sir Naitai speaks up, Yes, well, we're all glad that you're here, but if you don't mind, we were in the middle of a training session. He gives Mirio a look and the blonde grins sheepishly. Training, Izuku looks at Mirio, you're doing your internship here, 
Senpai? Mirio puffs up his chest with pride. Yup. I've been working with Surf for almost a year now. That's super cool. As Izuku speaks, the door behind him opens. Ah, there you are, Midraya-kun. He glances over his shoulder to see a short woman with a distinct, sharp-cut bob hairstyle that matches the jet-black color of her nails, she smiles warmly and extends her hand. Kemi Yuki, nice to meet you. The receptionist said you were on your way, but I figured you got lost. Don't worry about it, though, she adds when Izuku starts to apologize, this place can be a bit confusing for new people. I see you've already met Sir Nightai. She looks over at the man who nods politely in return. Kami-san, Sir Nightai says, I was, unaware you were taking on an intern this week. He doesn't sound too pleased at the surprise, but the healer waves him off. Oh, yeah, I wasn't really planning on it, she says, smiling at his Yuku, but recovery girl has spoken so highly of you. I just had to snatch you up before any of the other healers could. Izuku flushes slightly and looks down at his shoes. I, I hope she didn't oversell me, Mirio laughs and gives him a hefty pat on the back that nearly makes him lose his balance. You're too humble, Midraya kun He says, you've got a super rare quirk and you're a recommendation student. Have some pride. Izuku blinks. How do you know I'm a recommend? He trails off and shakes his head. Considering how displeased Shinsu was when he found out, there's a good chance he mentioned it, to others. News about Izuku seems to spread like wildfire enough. Who sponsored you? Bubble Girl asks, then catches herself, oh, wait a minute, it was probably Recovery Girl. Sir Nightai, who has been steadily looking more and more annoyed as they continue to talk catches Mirio's attention and jerks his head towards the door that no doubt leads to a training room. Mirio pats Izuku once more, before turning to follow his mentor, but Izuku quickly spots his chance. Actually, All Might was my sponsor, he says. Bubble Girl and Vapor Men make noises of surprise, but Izuku keeps his eye on Sir Night Eye. Just as he expected, the man stops dead in his tracks. What? He asks, turning around to fix Izuku with a firm but bewildered look, why would All Might sponsor a healer? Feigning, casualness, Izuku explains, oh, we met around a year before I got into a- I guess he saw my potential, but I have trouble controlling my quirks sometimes. See, I can kind of sense injuries and my quirk will automatically try to heal them. But if it's a big injury then my quirk won't stop and I'll eventually pass out from exhaustion. All Might wanted to help me get into I so that I could train, with recovery, girl San, so. Yeah, he sponsored me. It's a vague explanation and it doesn't divulge how he even met All Might in the first place, but it's enough to make Sir Knight I look suspicious. Is you could can practically see the gears turning in the man's head as his sharp eyes seemingly analyze the boy thoroughly. It's rather unnerving, actually, but Mirio distracts him with a loud oh of understanding, that explains the other day, then. Izuku and Bubble Girl tilt their heads questioningly and Mirio says, I was poking my head into the nurse's office after school one day and I saw All Might ruffling Madraya Kun's hair. I guess it makes sense now. He smiles at Izuku. You two seem close. Izuku rubs the back of his neck bashfully. Er. I guess so. That's awesome. Bubble Girl exclaims, man, to be sponsored by the number one hero? It was kind of crazy, Izuku admits, I think I confused a lot of people during the recommendation exam. Vaporman laughs and says, well, if you have both All Might and Recovery Girl in your corner, then I can't wait to see your quirk. I don't know how much I can help you with controlling it but I can definitely introduce you to the world of hero healers. Izuku's eyes sparkle eagerly. Thanks. And don't worry about the control thing my friend Nejire Senpai already gave me some advice that I'm excited to try out. Yeah, can't have you passing out anymore. Mirio grins, then cocks his head to the side curiously. Hey, speaking of, I was wondering what's the biggest injury you've ever healed? Izuku's smile widens bless his senpai for asking the right questions 
Sir Knight High is still gazing at him when he glances over. Making direct eye contact with the hero, as Yuku nonchalantly says, Oh, I regrew a stomach once. Sir Knight High's eyes widen. Holy shit, that's amazing. Bubble Girl exclaims, oblivious to her boss's silent freak out. A stomach? You can regrow organs? Mirio gapes at him and his Yuku giggles, nodding. Holy crap, wait, is that the big injury that made you go into a coma afterwards? Eh? Bubble Girl and Vapor Men stare at him in alarm. Is Yuku coughs awkwardly. Ah, uh, yeah. My quirk utilizes my own energy, so big injuries take a lot out of me. Hence, why I need to learn to control my quirk better. Vapor Men hums in thought. I see. Well, you let me know if there's anything I can do to help you out with, that. We can talk more about quirks later, though. She straightens up and turns to Sir Night Eye, who looks speechless. I've just finished organizing your medical wing. If you don't mind, I'd like to give Madryukun a quick tour of it before we go on our way. Sir Night Eye still hasn't torn his dumbfounded gaze away from his Yuku. Now Mirio and Bubble Girl are starting to notice his odd behavior, as well. Um, that's fine. Go right ahead. Bubble Girl says when her boss takes too long to respond. She bounces over to him and snaps her fingers in front of his face while Vapor Mend leads Izuku away. Mirio cheerfully waves as they leave. Turns out, Izuku had gone up one flight too many. Vapor Mend leads him back down to the third floor where they enter a room that looks much more hospital-like, than the previous one. Alright, then, let's get started, the healer says waving her arms around her, this is the Night Eye Agency medical wing. And those lovely people over there she gestures to a trio of adults gathered around a desk who watch them curiously. Are the medical team. Nakamura-san is the head healer and Kita-san and Sakuma-san are his medics. Most hero agencies are set up in a, similar way, with one head healer supported by multiple doctors that make up for their unrelated quirks with their dazzling medical degrees. She flourishes her hand flamboyantly and grins. Izuku laughs nervously, but the medics don't appear to be offended. They smile and greet him politely while Vapor Mend continues. As you may notice, this place isn't too big. That's because agencies like, Night Eyes are more focused on intel gathering rather than combat, so their medical wing is smaller than most. But when we go over to Endeavor's agency you'll see that their wing is a lot bigger. Actually, it's so big that I'm not the only healer that works there I've got a partner named Osaki-san. He's an older fellow, though, so he just sticks to the Endeavor Agency. Is Yuku nods, kind of, wishing he could take notes, and starts to ask, um, Vapor Men and the woman cuts him off with a wave. Oh, none of that. Just call me Kami-san. Is Yuku nods and opens his mouth to finish asking his question. But Kami just plows onward. Healers tend to stick to the agencies where their particular skills will be most useful. For example, my quirk, Healing Breath, works by utilizing the healing properties in the water droplets of my breath. Basically, if I breathe on an injury, it speeds up the healing process by about 50%. So it's really good for dealing with external wounds like burns, which is why I primarily work with the Endeavor Agency. The big guy's a great hero, but kinda messy. You'll see when we get there. At the mention of Endeavor, Izuku shifts uncomfortably. He's only ever met the man twice, but each time he wasn't very friendly. And now that he knows how Endeavor views healers, he isn't too eager to join his medical team, even if it's only temporary. Well, at least Totoraki will be there. He follows Kami as she walks around the medical wing. Continuing her explanation, other agencies like rescue agencies typically have healers with quirks like pain, stopping and stuff like that to help keep the civilians that they're rescuing calm. They also provide good on-site medical treatment, but I suppose that part could be applied to all combat medics. Oh. She perks up. There is one healer that I know of that works at underground agencies with a quirk that's like internal body cleansing or something. He could get rid of poisons and stuff. Do you, 
know why that quirk is best for underground agencies? She turns to face as Yuku, who is taken aback by the sudden question. He can already tell that Kami is the type to talk a lot and quickly too, so it takes him a moment to process what she asked. Uh. His mind whirls. Because. Underground heroes probably deal with. Sneakier villains? He struggles to find the right words. I mean, they might, do undercover work, stuff that most heroes can't do because they're in the media spotlight, so. The threat of drugs and poisons must be higher for them, compared to other heroes? It comes out sounding like a question. However, considering the pleased expression on Kami's face, it's the right answer. You've got the gist of it, yeah. She says, so. You see how it's important for healers to understand their specialities? He nods. Most healers communicate to some degree with each other and go where they're needed. So if, say, Endeavor gets poisoned by a villain, we'd call up our underground friend and have him come over. Healers, especially the more powerful ones, are constantly on the move. I bet you'll be just like Recovery Girl with a quirk as flexible as yours, you'll be traveling all across Japan during your career, healing heroes left and right. She grabs his hands and leans a bit too close to his face, grinning eagerly. Isn't it exciting? Her eyes are wide and sparkling with energy. She kind of reminds him of Nejire with her bubbly, in-your-face personality. Swallowing, he leans back slightly and stammers, uh, yeah, Tota let me show you how, everything's set up. She moves away as quickly as she came, spinning around and gesturing to a large cabinet probably full of medical supplies. Naitai's medical wing was in desperate need of a tune-up, so Kita-san called me over. Like my own mentor always said, all good medical wings need to have a she goes on to explain the logistics of setting up a hero agency's medical center, talking a mile a minute about everything from basic necessities to decorations to the cost of equipment which he won't even have to worry about since it will be paid for by the agency, but he gets the feeling that she just wanted an excuse to rant about some of the outrageous prices of particular equipment. He nods along politely, slightly overwhelmed by the abundance of information being dumped on him, so soon, and tries to remember as much as he can so he can write down notes later. It's a long time before Mirio's head pops through the door, startling Izuku. Excuse me, he says. Kami and the other doctors glance over, seeming entirely unsurprised at the sight of the teenage boy's face sticking through the door. Not trying to rush you or anything, but Sir says he wants to talk to Madraya Kun, before you guys leave. Kami stops talking for the first time in 20 minutes, miraculously not even slightly out of breath and cocks her head to the side. Why? I'm not quite sure, Miru says, but you know how he's a big All Might fan he's probably just curious about Madraya Kun cause he got sponsored by the guy. Well it's about time Sir Naitai decided to say something. It couldn't, have taken him that long to figure it out. Izuku smiles and looks to Kami for permission. Oh, go ahead then, she says, waving him off. Just don't take too long I wanna have time to get lunch before we have to go to Endeavor's place. Izuku nods. Mirio's face disappears for a moment before his senpai opens the door for him and dramatically gestures for him to join him in the hallway. Izuku, giggles and trots after the older boy as he begins leading the way. Mirio strikes up a friendly chat while they walk, talking about his intense training with Sir Nightai who apparently has a lot more physical skill than he appears to have. He's led to a smaller, more private office room, Mirio opens the door for him before giving him a quick pat on the shoulder and leaving. When he enters, he, spots Sir Naitai standing on the opposite end of the room, the tall man is facing away from him, his hands braced on his desk as he gazes out the window with hunched shoulders. It makes for a rather dramatic sight. But for some reason Izuku doesn't feel quite so nervous anymore. Sir Naitai is silent for a moment, then says quietly, Even though All Might and I haven't spoken to each other in years, I still keep a close eye on him. It would have been, impossible for me to not notice how he's been staying in his muscled form longer and longer each day, despite his injury. At first, 
I thought that perhaps he was just pushing himself. It would have been far from the first time he's done so. He straightens up and slowly turns to look over his shoulder at his Yuku. But now I know why. His gaze is firm but skeptical, as if he doesn't quite know what to make of him. His Yuku meets it calmly and says, I haven't healed him entirely yet. Sir Knight I blinks, then frowns. But you said just his stomach, his Yuku clarifies, then winces an apology at the interruption, I just grew back his stomach. I didn't even mean to, really, I just. He trails off, then figures he should probably start from the beginning. I met All Might last April after the incident with a sludge villain that resulted in a woman's death. Sir Knight I nods, as if he's very familiar with said incident, and considering how much All Might merchandise he has and how closely he's been watching the number one hero, he probably is. I stumbled across him in his weak form and he kind of accidentally coughed up blood on my face which was really gross but I ended up basically, grabbing him by the wrists and well, like I said earlier, my quirk activates automatically as soon as skin contact is made. He struggles not to ramble. I could sense his injuries and my quirk was trying to heal them as quickly as possible, but I eventually just ended up passing out. I didn't even realize who he was or what I had done until he visited me in the hospital a couple of days later, he told me about getting injured by that villain and, and that he had a stomach for the first time in years and I couldn't believe it. He looks down at his feet, smiling softly at the memories. And, well, recovery girl San offered to train me and he gestures as if to say the rest is history. Sir Knight I stares at him, clearly processing his words. But. I still don't understand why all. Might sponsored you. Oh. Izuka waves his hand sheepishly. That's just cause there was some old rule about teachers not being allowed to sponsor students, so recovery girl San couldn't do it herself and, well, All Might was more than willing to help out. He scratches the back of his neck, then forces himself to be steady and straightens up. I plan to heal him completely as soon as I learn how to control my work. And where are you with that? Sir Knight I asks. Now, is Yuku gets a bit nervous. He wrings his hands in his shirt and glances away with a sigh. Honestly, not very far. I've got a couple of ideas that might help, but I've basically gone my entire life without trying to train my work. It might be a while. He brightens slightly and adds, but we did find out that my work can be stopped if the skin contact is broken by someone else, like if they move away or move me. Then why don't you just do that? Sir Knight I asks, a bit demandingly. I know right? I totally could. Is Yuku agrees wholeheartedly, to the man's surprise. He sighs again, but recovery girl Sam said I have to get licensed before I can heal a pro hero. You know, cause of legalities and stuff. I wasn't really supposed to heal All Might the first time, but they let it go. Sir Knight I look slightly frustrated, which is Yuku understands. Eventually, though, he lets out a heavy exhale through his nose and says, I guess it can't be helped, then. Well, regardless, I want to thank you for healing him. His Yuku blinks in surprise when the man gives him a small smile. I never thought I'd ever see him be as strong as he is now again. His Yuku flushes and averts his gaze shyly. He'll never get used to such blatant praise. Oh, um, it's it's no problem. Sir Knight I arches a brow. Sounds like it was, though. What did Mirio say about you being in a coma? His Yuku decides to explain his quirk a bit more thoroughly, explaining how it usually works and how All Might's injury affected him. Sir, Knight I nods thoughtfully. Your quirk. I've never heard of something like it before. It's so powerful. It should be impossible. He murmurs the last part, as if to himself. He falls silent, his brows knitted in contemplation, and his uke waits patiently. He startles when Sir Knight I abruptly straightens up and looks at him. How much has All Might told you about me? His uke blinks. Er just that, you used to work together and that you broke up when he got injured. The hero huffs and grumbles something under his breath that Izuku doesn't catch. Pursing his lips, he says, 
My quirk is called foresight. It allows me to see a person's future. When All Might was injured he cuts himself off, a sharp exhale hissing through his teeth as he glances away. You don't understand. He was broken. A, deep pain flashes in those golden eyes. Izuku's chest suddenly feels tight. Sir Naitai pauses, inhales deeply, then continues, while he was hospitalized, I used my quirk on him. Another pause. And I saw that he would face off against a villain and die an unspeakably gruesome death. Izuku's breath catches in his throat. He stares at Sir Naitai with wide, disbelieving eyes. Whatever future, I see cannot be changed, this rule is absolute, as I myself have tried to change the future to no avail. But I knew, the man whispers, that if he was to continue on like that, with that body, he would only seal his fate. I couldn't stand by and just let this future play out, not with all might. Even though I knew it was hopeless, I had to at least try. He swallows heavily and continues, so, I, told him to retire. I told him to find a successor to pass the mantle of the symbol of peace onto. To spend the rest of his days as a legend, to live while he still could. His face twists into a grimace and he growls, and he refused. Even though he couldn't smile at all, he refused to stop fighting. And I couldn't support him. I couldn't watch him accept his fate. At that rate, everything would, have gone according to my foresight. It was going according to what I saw. His words trail off and he lifts his head towards Izuku. But I didn't see you. Heart in his throat, all Izuku can do is stare. He doesn't understand what he's saying. All Might is going to. I didn't see you, Sir Naitai repeats. His jaw clenches. He almost looks frustrated. I don't understand you. What is your place in all this? Izuku doesn't realize that he's stepped closer until the man is right in front of him, gazing down at him with an indecipherable expression. A boy with a healing quirk, rare even amongst rare quirks. Born of pure chance, with a complete disregard to genetics. An anomaly. His golden gaze seems to pierce Izuku. How could I have possibly foreseen you? Izuku. Doesn't know what to, say. Vaguely. He's reminded of his conversation with All Might after USJ, the man telling him how the villains lost because they didn't expect him. He swallows uneasily. Is he an anomaly? Everyone always seems so shocked by his quirk, even healers. What is he? Silence is his only response. Sir Knight Eye's eyes roam over him as he says, six or seven years. That was how far into his future I looked, that was when I saw his death. The further into the future I look, the less accurate the time. It could be this year or next year. His voice drops to a murmur, or it could have already passed. Huh? Is Yuku croaks. Sir Knight I takes a step back, still holding his gaze. In all my years as a hero, my foresight has never been wrong. I knew that even if I tried to change All Might's future I would, fail. But you. You weren't part of my vision. You can heal him, you can fix him, and I just can't help but wonder. Silence falls between them. Izuku doesn't notice him till now that his eyes are wet. Still, he somehow can't bring himself to wipe his tears just yet. Have I? He whispers shakily, have I? Changed anything? Sir Knight eyes throat bobs. I don't know. I'm not. Then, his eyes widen, ever so slightly. Inhaling deeply. He steps towards Izuku once more and raises his hand. Ever since I saw All Might's death, I decided to never read people's futures. From then on, I would only look seconds and minutes into the future. No more. But I. Izuku's gaze darts to his raised hand hovering inches away from his face, then back to his eyes. Wordlessly asking for permission. He nods in Sir, Naitai's hand gently cups the side of his face. Golden eyes turn purple. Mere seconds pass before those same eyes well up with tears. Izuku stiffens in alarm, but then the hand on his cheek slides to the back of his head and the next thing he knows he's being pulled against a chest. Long arms wrap around him, holding him tightly as a heartbeat louder than his own echoes in his ear. 
a chin drops, on top of his head with a shaky exhale. They stay like that for a long time, is Yuku awkwardly hugging a man so much taller than him. He can't tell what this hug means were those tears happy or sad? Is his future bad? The chin on his head shifts, and a voice croaks. I guess I should pay that man a visit, then. Is Yuku smiles, not bothering to prevent the giggle that escapes him as he burrows deeper, into Sir Naitai's chest. Well there's his answer. Chapter 19 is Yuku picks at his tempura half-heartedly all throughout lunch. His mind is still preoccupied with his conversation with Sir Naitai, wondering what the future will entail now he has supposedly interfered with the man's foresight. Kami remains oblivious to his distraction, continuing to incessantly chat about anything and everything, as she sits across, from him, only occasionally stopping to slurp up some udon. If he wasn't so used to the constant chatter from the because Gwent, he might find her annoying, but instead her babbling fades into the background as his mind gets lost in thought. After their hug ended, Izuku was kind of tempted to berate Sir Naitai for not visiting All Might sooner how could he leave his friend's side if he knew he was, going to die? However, since it's a rather personal matter that Izuku still probably doesn't fully understand the emotions of, he lets it go. He shouldn't involve himself in this any more than he already has. A buzz from his phone distracts him. Kak in 1.56 p.m. all good? Izuku rolls his eyes and sends a thumbs up emoji in response. They leave soon after that, Kami refusing his offer to pay for, his half of the meal, and return to the car. A pretty fancy one, in fact. They're driven by a tall, muscular looking woman who doesn't speak much, although she does give Izuku the occasional glance. Kami doesn't pay her any attention. So as Yuku follows her lead and instead keeps his attention on his new mentor. The Endeavor Hero Agency is a massive skyscraper that is Yuku is able to spot easily, before they even get close. Somehow, he thinks that it fits the flame hero perfectly, especially when he sees the stylized flaming E that adorns the front entrance. The inside is just as luxurious as the outside, fancy and no doubt expensive decorations visible all throughout the lobby. People bustle about busily, none of them paying much mind to the healer and her trainee as they make their way towards the elevator. When they're finally alone inside the elevator as Yuku mentally blanches at the sight of so many floors Kami turns to him with a grin. Well, what do you think? As Yuku gives her a weak smile in return. It's really big. Kami throws her head back in laughter and pats his shoulder. Yup. That's what I thought when I first came here. Don't worry, I'll only be giving you, a tour of the floors we'll be spending the most time on. As a healer in training, you don't really need to know the rest, and as a guest, you don't really get to see the rest. Is Yuku not? Right, some of these floors probably contain a lot of classified information, of course she can't go showing some high school student around the whole agency. I'll show you all the fun stuff first before we get, to the medical wing, Kami promises with a wink. The elevator dings and they step out. Izuku nearly gets shoulder checked as a man brushes past him in a blur and Kami scoffs. You may notice that there's a shit ton of people here. Yeah, no kidding, Izuku says, making sure to stay close to her side. That's because there's a lot more to a hero agency than just heroes, she explains, there's intel gathering, a legal department, human resources all the little cogs that make the clock tick, you know? Izuku nods and asks, what about sidekicks? Oh, the big guy's got about 30 of them. The surprise must show on his face because Kami laughs and shakes her head, bobbed hair swaying slightly. Don't get the wrong idea everyone knows that Endeavor's a solo act. The sidekicks usually take care of minor jobs or guard the villains that Endeavor defeats until they can be handed over to the police. They don't get much of the spotlight, but they all seem to be pretty proud of what they do. The flaming sidekickers, that's what they're called. She makes a face at this and as Yuku giggles. Do you think we'll see any? He asks, trying not to seem too eager. Probably. I'm gonna show you the lounge first we might run into some there. They do in fact run into a couple of sidekicks in the lounge. 
Izuku does his best not to fanboy out, even though he doesn't recognize them, and tries to pay attention to Kami as she shows him around. The two sidekicks seem to be off duty and are chatting idly while splayed out across one of the couches, so he doesn't want to bother them. The lounge itself is very nice and luxurious, much like the rest of the building, and Kami promises they can hang out there later. Next she shows him the dining commons and Izuku takes the opportunity to mention the connection between his cork and food. Lucky. She whines, you get an excuse to eat as much as you want. But when I go for a third plate. She lets her sentence hang, puffing out her cheeks in a childish pout. Izuku laughs. Afterwards, he gets to see the personal gym the sidekicks use to train the justification for this being he needs to know where to go in the case of training accidents. It probably doesn't have anything to do with the way Kami smirks at him as he gawks at two sidekicks sparring with each other. The tour keeps going on for the next two hours. Just when, Izuku thinks they've reached the last place, Kami takes him somewhere new. It's incredible and overwhelming and fun and exhausting all at the same time. By the time they finally reach the medical center, Izuku kind of just wants to sit down for a while. And here we are. Kami announces, gesturing widely to the medical center that is much bigger than Serenitai's final destination. We'll be spending most of our time here, obviously. The Endeavor Agency Medical Center encompasses an entire floor looking very much like a large hospital within a building. Rows upon rows of beds line one wall with curtains available on the sides to be pulled whenever they're needed. Izuku glances around at the expensive machinery here and there and notices that there's even a few separate rooms at the other end of the floor. Kami takes him there first, showing him the radiology unit, surgery rooms, the intensive care unit, personal offices, bathroom so much more than he could have thought of when imagining a hero agency's medical wing. It basically is just a giant hospital. There's also a lot of doctors and nurses roaming around. Kami weaves past them, seemingly looking for a particular person. Osaki-san. She calls out, waving her arm at an older man currently frowning down at a clipboard. He looks up, appearing a bit irritated, but then his expression smooths out when he spots her. Kami Kun, welcome back. His eyes slide over to Izuku, who stares back at him. Something about this guy seems familiar. Kami puts a hand on the freckled boy's back and gently pushes him forward. This is Madraya Kun. Recovery girl's apprentice, remember? I remember, Osaki says, holding out his hand. Nice to meet you, Madraya Kun. My name is Oaski Kai. Something clicks in Izuku's brain and his eyes widen in realization. Osaki Kai. He's the healer that got kidnapped all those years ago. The one that villains stole from Endeavor when was it? Over 15 years ago? Maybe, 20? Izuku realizes that he's been staring for too long and snaps himself out of his stupor, hastily shaking Osaki's hand. Hi hello. I'm Madraya Izuku. Osaki's wrinkled eyes twinkle with amusement. What a strapping young man. He retracts his hand and gives Izuku a once-over. You've been quite the buzz in the medical community. Recovery Girl has spoken highly of you and your quirk. Oh, um. He flushes in embarrassment as his mind blanks on how to respond. Beside him, Kami snickers and puts a hand on his shoulder. He's a timid one, but he's got spirit. I can tell. I don't doubt that, Osaki says, glancing between them, how has your tour been going then? Pretty good. Kami boasts, I've saved the best for last. I thought I'd go around introducing him to everyone, since, he's gonna be here for a while. Osaki nods amicably and sends them off with well wishes soon after. For the next half hour, Kami practically parades his Yuku around the facility. He feels bad when she blatantly interrupts medics while they're working. But they don't seem to mind. It's as if they're used to Kami's odd antics at this point. There's too many new names and faces for him to remember. But they all greet him kindly with curiosity in their eyes. Izuku wonders if it's because they don't often have healers in training as young as him come by very often, or if it's because, as Osaki said, 
He's the buzz in the medical community. Part of him hopes it's the former. As Cami introduces him to people, she also explains more about the medical center. Most of the patients we treat are, sidekicks coming back from patrol, she says, but, like I said earlier, Endeavor's kind of a messy guy, so we also deal with. Ah, uh, how do I say this? Collateral damage. Izuku blinks and tilts his head. Sometimes he accidentally burns the civilians he's meant to be saving, and if it's bad enough we take care of them here rather than letting them go to a regular hospital. Since those cases are, kind of the big guy's fault, their treatment is free of charge. It's a great way to avoid a lawsuit. Oh, Izuku says, somehow not surprised to learn this. He's seen the way Endeavor fights on TV, and while he's certainly skilled and powerful, there's also a sense of recklessness to his fighting style. He supposes the accidental burns could also be attributed to the generally untamable nature of fire, but he's more inclined to believe the former to be the cause. It also happens with villains, too, Kami adds. At his surprised expression, she quickly adds, not that we ever bring them back here, no, no. That'd be too much of a risk. But she cuts herself off, then switches gears. Well, since I'm a combat medic, you'll be training as one as well this week. Usually, we stay here a while, the heroes are on patrol and then go if they need us, but if they ever get called out for a particular incident, then we go with them. Of course, we stay away from the fighting, but once the threat's down we move in. She stops walking and Izuku does too, turning to face her and she gives him a firm look. Now, I know that the media and the news and no doubt your school has taught you to adore, heroes and hate villains. But you need to, understand this, we, as healers, are a neutral party. Above all else, our duty is to save lives. Hero or villain, good or bad, that doesn't matter to us. We are separate from that. We cannot let our personal feelings on a matter get in the way of our work. It's not our place to judge the value of life based on the actions of the individual for healers, all life is equal. Do you understand? Izuku, stares at her, taken aback. So. We have to save villains too? He's. Never thought about that before. Saving villains. Healing the people that his classmates are learning to defeat using his quirk to undo what heroes have done. It feels. Kind of wrong. However, Kami nods. Sometimes. She pauses. Well, actually a good number of times. Many villains don't stop fighting until they're, unconscious. I mean, think about it. How do you think a villain would look after a fight with Endeavor? Or even All Might? Is Yuku frowns in contemplation. He's never really considered what happens to villains after a fight. Not not many people do, really. He's just assumed they're taken by the police. Once the battle's done, all the media attention is on the victorious hero. Anything about the villain is added as an afterthought. As much as he doesn't like the idea of healing villains, he supposes. If he was ever put into the situation, he wouldn't be able to turn his back on an injured person good or bad. Even if that person was a villain. He could imagine he would still try to save them, if they were really in danger of dying. The thought of letting someone die while he was able to, do something to stop it makes him feel nauseous. In the back of his mind, he recalls Totoraki's words during USJ, having a soft heart won't benefit you when it comes to villains. USJ was different, though. He just felt bad that Totoraki was hurting those villains in such an unorthodox way. But all we do is stabilize them. Kami adds hastily, trying to ease his mind, we just make sure they, stay alive long enough to make it to the hospital, you know? And there's always a bunch of sidekicks on guard just in case the villains try anything, so you don't need to worry about them hurting you. No, it's okay. I get it. I think. He looks up at her and gives a small, uneasy smile. I mean. They're people too. I guess I kind of like that our duty is to life. That we're. Neutral. Kami, smiles back. It has its perks. You get to boss heroes around when they're hurt. Medical authority, you know? 
She giggles before sobering up. Anyway, you've had a long day. Why don't we go get some dinner and then I'll show you where you'll be sleeping at night. He nods gratefully and follows her as she leads the way out of the infirmary. Something niggles at the back of his mind and he pipes, up, hey, you never mentioned healing endeavor. Doesn't he get hurt from villain fights? Cammy throws her head back and laughs. Oh, you bet. Not that he'd ever admit it, though. If you try to heal him while he's still out in the field, he'll get real snippy with you and insist that he's fine, even if he's literally bleeding from every limb. He likes to put on a tough face when the cameras are out. Osaki-san and I try to remind him that healers have medical authority over heroes, but alas. She shrugs as if to say what can you do? I usually just try to pounce on him while he's in his office. Only way to heal him. It's like trying to get a cat into a bathtub. He snorts at the comparison. As they walk back to the dining commons, he tries to keep an eye out for Totoraki, but he doesn't find him. Surely he'll see him at some point during the week, even if it is a big building. He wonders how Totoraki's first internship day was. Somehow he can't imagine Endeavor being a very good teacher. Dinner is a relatively calm affair. Kami's vibrant energy seems to be dwindling down and she doesn't talk as rapidly or as loudly as before during their meal. As they eat, Izuku texts, Kaken, who complains about his apparently terrible experience with Best Genist. Kaken thinks he's made a mistake choosing him, but Izuku reassures him by reminding him that it's just the first day. Surely things will be more exciting later. Never mind that he himself hopes that the rest of the week isn't more exciting than his first day was there was way too much going on today. By the time, Kami leads him to the guest room, he's ready to collapse. He bids her good night and takes off his bag, sluggishly changing into his pajamas before flopping face first onto the bed. He only has half a mind to appreciate how comfortable his bed is before he falls asleep. The first thing is Yuku learns on his second day of his internship is that Kami is a morning person. She knocks on his door at 8 a.m., with a bright smile and a skip in her step. Is Yuku, on the other hand, has always been a bit of a slow starter. While people like Kami and Kaken are able to wake up fully energized and ready to start the day, Is Yuku doesn't quite wake up until after he's had time to digest his breakfast. Kami, however, doesn't seem to care. She blabbers on incessantly while Izuku tries to keep his face from, dipping into his bowl of cereal, rapidly blinking his eyes open every time they start to slide shut. He's in the midst of stifling a yawn when a particular question catches his attention. By the way, kid, where are you with self-defense? Kami asks. Izuku blearily blinks as his mind struggles to catch up. Huh? Self-defense, she repeats. I know you're in the hero course, but surely they, teach quirkless sparring before the kids get to use their quirks, right? Oh. Yeah, he says, I've, uh, been taking self-defense lessons since I was 10. Kami nods, looking strangely serious. That's good. It's important for healers to know how to defend themselves. Especially you, a quirk like yours might catch some unwanted attention. Ah. So that's where she's going with this. Oh, yeah, I, no. Recovery Girl San already gave me this talk. He tries not to sound too dismissive. After a pause, he asks, um, Osaki-san. Is he the one that? He trails off, not quite knowing how to ask. Kami seems to understand, though. She straightens up. You know about that, then? Yeah, he says. My doctor told my mother about it as soon as my quirk manifested. It kinda of freaked her out, so she, always wanted me to take self-defense lessons. Kami hums. Yeah, it freaked everyone out, really. I was barely beginning my training when it happened. Osaki-san doesn't talk about it much, but I'm pretty sure it's why he hardly ever leaves the agency. It was a big scare, I mean. All the hero agencies really tightened up their security around their healers afterwards. That's why I'm always, traveling with one of Endeavor's sidekicks. Izuku makes a noise of surprise and Kami asks, Didn't you notice our driver yesterday? Dot dot oh. 
He didn't realize that the woman was a sidekick. Yup. Cammy pops the pee, then leans closer. Healers aren't really allowed to travel by themselves. Of course, you went to Night Eyes on your own, but since your teacher saw you to the station, you were only ever by yourself during the train ride, and even then you were surrounded by other civilians. But later when we go to other agencies, or even if we get called into the field, we always have to be accompanied by at least one pro hero. Izuku must not look too pleased because she adds, it might seem restrictive, but it's to keep us safe. Izuku nods, idly recalling his own near kidnapping experience. Besides, most sidekicks are happy to hang out with us. And we don't have to drive ourselves anywhere, so that's a plus. I kind of suck at driving. She laughs and Izuku snorts. Yeah, he could imagine that. The rest of the day is spent in the medical center. He shadows Kami the entire time, watching how she works with the medics and interacts with the injured patients. He's excited to see her quirk in action, only to be mildly disappointed. She said earlier that her quirk speeds up the healing process by 50%, but part of him thought that that meant the injury would become 50% healed as soon as she used her quirk. Instead, a wound that might normally take two weeks to heal would now only take one. It's still interesting, but he can see a few potential weaknesses it carries. Cammy's quirk wouldn't be too helpful in a critical situation, like if someone was in danger of bleeding to death. Not to mention that since her breath can only reach external wounds, she wouldn't be able to do anything for stab wounds or internal injuries. He could also imagine the risk of her becoming dehydrated if she were put into a situation that required her to overuse her quirk. Honestly, he thinks Osaki would be better for combat medic work. His quirk allows him to transfer any wounds he's able to touch onto himself. He seems to have a slightly increased self-healing ability too as well as a high pain tolerance, although that might be attributed to him using his quirk for so many years. As incredible as this power is, it also has some rather negative drawbacks. Osaki is always, covered in bandages to hide the injuries that he transfers to himself, and he also has to limit himself so that he doesn't take on more than his body can handle. His body also won't let him take on any potentially fatal injuries, and his quirk only works on the wounds that he can touch. So, like Kemi, he can't do anything for internal wounds. All of these weaknesses are confirmed by Kami and Osaki when he asks them. Despite knowing his own quirk's drawbacks, he can't help feeling quite lucky to have a quirk like his. Being tired seems trivial compared to what his mentors have to deal with. It's also interesting to see the way Kami interacts with the injured sidekicks coming back from their patrol. The first sidekick she sees to immediately starts talking about the villain fight he just got into. He's rather dramatic about it, gesturing wildly with his hands and emphasizing the danger aspect of his experience. He's obviously exaggerating just to make himself seem cooler, but Kami just hums and nods along as she treats his wounds. At first, Izuku thinks she's just being nice. Maybe she really likes this particular sidekick for some reason? But then she does the same exact thing with the next one that comes in an hour later, and, for the life of him he can't understand why. It seems so unlike her, to pander to these outrageous tales the sidekicks are telling just to make them feel better. While one hero is in the midst of rehashing today's harrowing battle, Kami gestures for Izuku to come over. She asks him how he would heal this hero's wound mostly minor lacerations to her left leg and when he gives his answer she looks satisfied. He wonders if she'll let him use his quirk, but recalls that he's not allowed to heal pro heroes until he's licensed, even if he's under the supervision of a medical professional. Maybe he'll be allowed to heal some civilians later. Kami has him patch up the sidekick's leg after she uses her quirk on it. Wrapping up wounds is effortless for him at this point, but she still watches him the entire time. Thanks, kid. The sidekick says once Izuku is finished, hopping off the bed. She flashes Kami a grin. See you later, Kami-san. Take it easy out there. Kami calls after her as she walks away. Once the hero is gone, Izuku turns to the healer with a confused frown. Uh. Kami-san. Why do you? 
Urum, act like that. With the heroes, I mean. The woman laughs and starts, gathering up the bloodied gauze. You mean why do I act like a starstruck schoolgirl? Izuku smiles sheepishly and nods. Kami snorts, cause it makes them feel better. Let me tell you something, kid. Heroes love nothing more when people fawn over them. They like to be made to feel like the tough guys, you know? They like to feel big. Yeah, but. Izuku is still unconvinced. I mean, it's not. Our job to boost their self-esteem. No, it's not, Kami agrees, but I do it anyway because it makes them easy to manage. Huh? Listen, kid, throughout your time as a healer, you're gonna have to deal with heroes that you probably wouldn't normally get along with too well in a regular setting. But if you tell them what they want to hear, then they'll like you no matter what, and they won't give you much trouble. She turns to him and leans against the bed, pressing the back of her hand to her forehead dramatically. You've just got to say things like that's so cool or that sounds scary or wow, you must be so brave. She bats her eyelashes at him and his yuku giggles. Put on a show and act like every hero you meet is your favorite hero. I don't know if I'd be very convincing. He admits, I'm not much of an actor. Don't knock it till you try it. Trust me, there'll be putty in your hands. She winks before turning and continuing to roll up the leftover gauze. Besides, she chirps, I like making people feel better. Izuku supposes that it wouldn't be too awful to put aside his pride and stroke a hero's ego for a bit. He thinks about his more difficult patients like, Kakan and Monoma. The former can be stubborn and irritable sometimes actually, all the time in the latter. Well, he doesn't seem to like anyone in class 1A. He hums in thought. Sweet talking sounds a lot better than getting bossy. I suppose it could be worth a shot. As time passes, Izuku starts to wonder if he'll even get to use his quirk today. Sure, it's only the second day, but he's, eager to take Nejire's advice and put it into action. The medical wing gradually turns orange in the light of the sun as it dips closer to the horizon. There's been a bit of a lull for the past hour, but it's interrupted when a couple of sidekicks burst in, carrying an obviously injured civilian between them. Kami takes one look at the third degree burn on the woman's leg and curses under her, breath. You'd think that a hero as experienced as Endeavor would be better at aiming for the right target, she grumbles to Izuku. Actually. One of the sidekicks winces an apology as he helps set the woman down on the bed. This was Burnin's fault. It was an accident, of course. But. Kami looks unimpressed. And why didn't she bring this poor woman in herself? She sniffs. The other sidekick, snorts, probably cause she knew you'd dare her head off. Um, the injured civilian says, can I get some help here? Her expression is tight with pain and her voice wavers. Honestly, considering how ugly the burn is, Izuku is surprised she's not crying. Right, of course. Kami immediately starts examining her wound, Izuku hovering over her shoulder. Much like how he does with the burns Kakan causes, Kami has to carefully remove the seared cloth of her pants from the injury. Once it's clear, she falls silent and just gazes at it for a moment. Then, she turns to Izuku and asks, Hey, kid. Wanna show off that gork of yours? Huh? He asks, Are you sure? Kami nods. Yeah, even if I use mine, this is still gonna take weeks to heal. The injured woman flinches. Come on, I've been dying to see your quirk ever since recovery girl told me about you. Izuku hesitantly switches places with her and slowly reaches out to put his hands on the woman's leg. The burn runs horizontally along her thigh, and while it is severe, it's not extremely big. He can feel everyone's eyes on him Kami, the civilian, the two sidekicks but he forces himself to concentrate on himself as his. Gork activates. Like Nejire said, he tries to focus on where his energy leaves his body, rather than the energy itself. Obviously, the point he's drawn to is his fingertips. He isn't quite sure what to do now, he doesn't feel something tangible that he could have a grasp on. Still, he tries to do what his senpai suggested and close off that exit. He shuts his eyes and tries to imagine. 
Just take, that channel the energy is flowing from and narrow it down. Didn't Najir say something about a hose? Try to step on the hose, to stem that flow of water. Holy shit. That's amazing. Izuku startles out of his thoughts, his quirk shutting off. Everyone around him is staring at the completely healed skin under his palms, but Izuku notices something else. His fingertips are tingling. It's like, he's suddenly aware of this part of his body that he had never really felt before. He didn't even succeed in slowing down his energy, but somehow that analogy Najir said makes perfect sense. It's like the hose is in his fingers. But not literally. It's hard to describe, even to himself, but he felt it. It was like the point of his quirk's concentration. It wasn't tangible, but it felt like it, could be. Whatever it was, he needs to try it again. There isn't even a scar. Kami peers at the non-existent burn with wide eyes. The civilian looks shocked too. It feels totally better. The pain just went away like that. She turns her stare to Izuku. Who are you? Izuku smiles politely and says, My name's Madraya Izuku. I'm an apprentice doing my internship week with Kami-san. Damn. Kami-san, where do you find this kid? One of the sidekicks asks. Kami looks just a bit smug. Recovery girl is mentoring him at a, but she let me take him for the week. She turns to Izuku. You were worried about her overselling you, but I don't think she sold you enough. That's seriously an amazing quirk. Is it like Osaki Sans? The sidekick asks, but Izuku shakes his head and explains how, his quirk works. She gives him an impressed look. You've got something really special there, kid. Izuku flushes and thanks her. They're able to send the civilian off soon, but only after she thanks Izuku profusely, much to the greenet's embarrassment. Then, Kami claps him on the shoulder and steers him towards the door. Let's go get dinner, she says, you deserve it. You've done really well, for your second day. I'm glad, Izuku says. You feeling tired? Kami asks, a tinge of concern in her eyes. I was gonna give you a brief rundown of the night shift after dinner, but I know your quirk saps your energy, so no, no, it's alright. Izuku insists. Even though he is pretty tired not from his quirk, just from the long day in general he wants to learn as much as he can while he's, here. I usually only get tired after healing big injuries or just a lot of smaller ones. I'm fine, really. Kami nods and they take the elevator up to the dining commons. Dinner is calm, a couple of other medics join their table and chat with Kami, so Izuku is able to relax and text Kakin, whose second day wasn't much better than his first. Kakin 7.02pm bastard fucking gave me a haircut, Midraya 7.02pm omg, plaza sent pics. Kakin 7.03pm fuck no. Kakin 7.04pm he also fucking put me in jeans. How the fuck am I supposed to fight villains in jeans? Midraya 7.05 p.m. I repeat, um, Plaza sent pics. Kakin 7.05 p.m. Fuck you. Soft snickering to himself, Izuku pockets his phone and continues eating. The food here is amazing despite not liking Endeavor too much. He's gotta admit, the guy's agency is pretty great. Maybe later he can check out the training facilities when Kami's not too busy. Once he finishes his dinner, he idly listens in on the medic's conversation until Kami announces that it's time to go. He bids his goodbyes and follows the healer as they make their way out of the dining commons. This shouldn't take too long, so don't worry, Kami reassures, stepping into the elevator, I'm just gonna introduce you to the night shift staff and have them explain how their duties go. Not too different from what we do, but there are some differences to take note of. Okay. Izuku nods, noticing that the elevator is slowing down. It must be stopping to pick up someone on another floor. The doors slide open to reveal Endeavor, in all his flaming glory, standing with Totoraki. As soon as their gazes land on Izuku, their faces morph into expressions of surprise. Midraya-kun? Totoraki's eyes widen. Izuku smiles. Totoraki-kun. Kami-san. Endeavor growls, turning his glare to the healer. 
Endeavor. Kami finishes, smirking, you coming in, or what? What is he doing here? Endeavor demands. He's here for his internship, Kami replies simply. The flame hero's eyes narrow. And why, wasn't I made aware that my agency nominated both Shadow and Mindraya? Unfazed by his aggressive aura, Kami says smoothly, he's not the agency's intern, he's my intern. The doors start to close but Endeavor holds them open with a large hand. I suggest you come in. Clenching his jaw, Endeavor shoots his Yuku a sharp look before stepping into the elevator. The massive man takes up a significant amount of space and his Yuku leans away from him to avoid his flames. He brightens when Totoraki comes to stand between him and his father. Sorry I didn't say anything earlier, his Yuku says, I wanted it to be a surprise. Thankfully, Totoraki doesn't look upset. We could have traveled here together, he says. His Yuku shakes his head. Oh, no, I really did have to go to the Night Tai Agency first. I met up with Kami San there. And how do you like it here so far? Totoraki asks, ignoring the holes his father's eyes are drilling into the back of his head. It's nice, his Yuku replies honestly, Kami San is teaching me a lot. What about you? He's interrupted by a loud alarm. They all look at Endeavor as he takes out his phone his screen lighting up. His flames seem to grow larger. There's an incident in Hazu, he declares, more to Totoraki than anyone else, we're being called out. He jabs the elevator's buttons, somehow overriding the previous order to stop at the medical floor, and they start going down to one of the lower floors. Come, Shouto. Endeavor steps out of the elevator and starts barking orders to the nearest person he sees. Totoraki casts his Yuku a parting glance, before following his father. To the green at surprise, Kami ushers him out of the elevator too. We're going with them, kid, she says. Huh? He asks, but I thought remember what I told you yesterday? She asks, glancing at him. His Yuku blinks, recalling. Usually, we stay here while the heroes are on patrol and then go if they need us. But if they ever get called out for a particular incident, then we go with them. Of course, we stay away from the fighting, but once the threat's down we move in. Right. That was before she told him about healing villains. There's a special ambulance we travel in, Kami says, gently pulling him along, I'll have someone bring down your costume. The next few minutes go by very quickly. Endeavor and Totoraki leave almost immediately after the Alert is sent out, multiple sidekicks rushing after them. His Yuku hastily changes into his costume while Kami gets into the front with a sidekick. He nearly loses his balance when the ambulance starts driving and grabs onto one of the overhead railings to steady himself. Normally, driving to Hazu might take a decent amount of time, but with the sirens of the ambulance blaring, they're able to speed through the streets quickly without having to worry about getting stuck in traffic. As they get closer and closer to their destination, Izuku feels himself becoming rather nervous. They're going into a real fight right now. We're entering Hazu. The sidekick calls out over the loud alarm. Kami glances over the back of her seat to check on Izuku. Things are gonna move pretty fast, but I need you to stick by my side. Okay. He yelps when the ambulance flies over a rough bump. We're going to be staying far enough away to be safe but close enough to assist, Kami tells him, but this is an active situation and things can change at any moment, so you listen to what the heroes tell you, alright? Okay. The ambulance takes a sharp left, causing the whole vehicle to wobble dangerously, and, Izuku struggles to stay in his seat. As soon as he rights himself, the sidekick gasps right before something crashes into the front of the ambulance. For a long moment, all he can hear is the sound of tearing, crunching metal. He's thrown out of his seat as the ambulance stops abruptly and just barely manages to catch himself before he hits the opposite wall. The chaos stops as quickly as it started. Disoriented, Izuku looks up and realizes that the ambulance must have crashed. The siren has gone silent and the lights are off, leaving Izuku in pitch black darkness. He slowly gets to his feet, 
his legs trembling he didn't get injured, but panic and fear is starting to flood his veins. Kami-san? He calls out. Hearing no response, he carefully makes his way to the back of the ambulance, and forces the door open. As soon as he rounds the corner, he gasps in shock. A massive beast with pale, leathery wings stares at him with wild, unfocused eyes. Izuku feels like his heart stops. It's another Namu. It has to be, with its brain sticking out like that. The Namu opens its jaws and lets out an ear-piercing shriek, startling Izuku out of his stupor. A second later, two flaming whips, wrap around the beast's neck and yank it backwards. Kid. The sidekick that drove them yells as she jumps out of the ambulance, get out of here. She ducks as the Namu swipes at her and lashes at it with one of her whips. The Namu shrieks again, and it's loud enough to spur Izuku into action. Kami-san. He dashes around to the other side of the ambulance, briefly taking in the crushed hood, and yanks open the passenger door. Kami-san, we have to. The woman is unconscious, head lolled to the side as blood dribbles down the side of her temple. Swallowing down a cry, Izuku immediately unbuckles her seatbelt and tries dragging her out, but her legs are trapped under the broken dashboard. Kid. The sidekick yells again, I said get out of here. But Kami-san. He protests. I'll, take care of her ah. She cries out as the Namu swipes at her. The sidekick is clearly overwhelmed by her opponent, but she must have called for backup because as Yuku can see other heroes running over to them, Endeavor included. The Namu knocks the sidekick aside and lunges for as Yuku, who instinctively freezes in fear despite his brain screaming at him to dodge. Flames lick his hair as a large ball of fire flies past his head, narrowly missing him. It strikes the Namu instead forcing it to stumble backwards with an ear-piercing shriek. A moment later, Endeavor barges past him and starts pummeling the Namu. Get him out of here. He barks at one of his sidekicks, not sparing his Yuku a single glance. A hand grabs him by the upper arm and starts pulling him away. Come on, kid, another man, says. His Yuku struggles not to stumble as he hurries after him, cursing himself for freezing like that. He hasn't felt fear like this since USJ, except this time he doesn't have his friends with him. The sidekick glances over his shoulder and hisses under his breath. Izuku looks too and sees that the Namu has escaped Endeavor's grasp and is in the air, dodging the fireball the flame hero throws at it. The sidekick glances back at Izuku, briefly looking torn, then straightens up and orders, go hide somewhere safe. I'll find you later. He pushes Izuku towards a nearby alleyway. Not needing to be told twice, Izuku hastily scrambles away. He darts into the alley and keeps running. He didn't notice it earlier, but he can hear sounds of crashing and screaming coming from all around him. Dark, clouds of smoke hang above the buildings and civilians flash by the mouth of the alleyway, fleeing from some unseen threat. Not wanting to find out what it is, Izuku ducks down another alley and keeps running. He doesn't know how long he runs for, or how far he goes. All he can focus on is trying not to pass out as he dashes from alley to alley, never stepping onto the streets and gasping for breath the entire time. After what feels like hours, although it's probably only 10 minutes, he slows down. Legs shaking with fear and adrenaline, he leans against the nearest wall and listens. Things are quieter around here. He must be far from the fray. He feels his phone buzz in his pocket. Totoraki 8.45 PM sidekick said you ran off. Where are you? Totoraki 8.49 PM I can't find you. Couple sidekicks, are hurt. Totoraki 8.53 PM please respond. Izuku immediately feels guilt claw at his throat. He was so panicked, he completely forgot that he has an actual job here to do. Whatever is going on, it must be big. He doesn't know if that was the only Namu that's causing trouble, but either way, one is enough to cause a lot of injuries. He needs to get his act together and help people, especially since, Kami is unconscious. He feels a brief flash of worry for his mentor as he struggles to type out his response. Trembling with fear and adrenaline, his fingers are too shaky to type, 
so eventually he just sends his location to Totoraki before pocketing his phone again. God, where the hell am I? He whispers to himself, glancing around. In his fright, he hadn't been paying attention to where he was, running. All he could think about was getting as far away from that Namu as possible. As soon as he starts walking over to the street, a scream stops him in his tracks. Startled, he whips his head around. This part of the city is fairly quiet, so he could hear the scream loud and clear. It sounded like it came from deeper within the alleys. Heart speeding up again, his Yuku turns away from the street, and starts jogging towards the cry. He doesn't hear any other sounds of fighting, so maybe somebody's injured? If it's just that, then he can help. He has to be careful that he's not walking himself right into another fight, though. The greenet hesitantly peeks around the corner of a building, seeing nothing but another empty alleyway. He frowns, wondering if his mind was playing tricks on him, with that scream, but then, he hears someone snarl, I'll kill you. That voice. He knows that voice. But. He's never heard it sound like that before. Hard jumping to his throat, his Yuku rushes down the alleyway, which opens up into an empty parking lot. He dashes across it, diving into another alley and racing to the end of that one. Having no idea where he's going, Izuku rounds the corner and abruptly skids to a halt, gasping at the scene in front of him. Two bloodied figures lay slumped against the floor, one he recognizes as the pro hero native and the other he recognizes as Ida. A third man stands over his friend, the jagged sword in his hand poised to strike. Izuku's eyes widen and time seems to slow down. In the back of his mind, he must have known Ida's reason for choosing to do his internship in Hazu, the city where his brother was attacked. He just never thought. Someone as rational and logical as Ida would go looking for. Totoraki's voice echoes in his head, anger can make you do stupid things. So that must mean. That this man standing before him is. The hero killer Stain glances up at Izuku's shocked gasp and looks over at the freckled boy. Izuku's breath catches in his throat, feeling, frozen with fear as blood-red eyes land on him. Another child? The killer growls, gaze roaming over him. His eyes land on the medical symbol on his chest and he makes a noise in his throat. A healer? He seems to relax ever so slightly. Mimidriyakun? Ida croaks struggling to move his head, what are you get out of here? Run. Listen to your friend, boy, Stain agrees, it's my duty to, kill fake heroes, but you don't need to die as well. I have no quarrel with healers. Is Yuku's eyes between the villain and his friend frantically, mind whirling frantically as he wonders what to do. He can't fight Stain even if he did have a combative quirk, he wouldn't stand a chance against the hero killer. But he can't just run away either. He he's not a hero. He manages to squeak, he. He's, just a student. Stain's cold gaze is unforgiving. Even so, I can already tell that he will grow up to become just another fake hero poisoning this toxic society. After all, he didn't come here to save this other fake. He jerks his head at native slumped against the wall. He just came to fulfill his own vengeful desire. Ida lets out a choked noise and rasps, Midraya-kun, please please, leave. Don't get involved. This has nothing to do with you. He looks angry, eyes wet with unshed tears as he hisses at the ground. Izuku's heart breaks to see his friend like this. Torn, he glances between Ida and Stain before shakily moving into a fighting stance, raising his fists in front of him. Even if he can't fight this man, Maybe he can distract him long enough for help to arrive? He, knows Totoraki is looking for him, maybe he'll at the sight of his fighting stance. The hero killer lets out a bark of laughter, are you that desperate to save your friend? Don't waste your blood on phonies like him, boy. Healers are far too rare to squander their life on such trivial matters. Surely you must know that. Stop it. Ida snaps, run away. I told you, this has nothing to do with, you. Frustrated, Izuku snaps back, if you say that, then heroes can do anything. Recalling All Might's words, he says, meddling when you don't need to is the essence of being a hero. 
you're not a hero. Ida snarls and his Yuku flinches, god damn it, run away. You're going to get yourself killed. His cries are drowned out by the hero killer's laugh. He grins wildly at his Yuku and the greenette, gulps. Oh, you are a little hero, aren't you? A better one than these fakes, by far. He sneers down at Ida briefly before looking back at his Yuku. It's a pity you weren't born with a more suitable quirk. This corrupt society would be better if all heroes had hearts like yours. It's such a threatening way to compliment someone that it just leaves his Yuku feeling confused. He's even more confused, when Stain tilts his head and rumbles, Your Madraya is Yuku, aren't you? How how do you know my name? Is Yuku asks. It seems a villain named Shigaraki has his eyes on you. Is Yuku tenses up. He showed me a picture of you from the sports festival. Said you were a particularly troublesome little healer. He sniffs. I can see why now. However, I still have a duty to uphold. He turns his attention back to Ida, lifting his sword once again, and his Yuku's heart skips a beat. Wait. Stain pauses and his Yuku frantically tries to think of what to say. Uh. You why are you you're obviously trying to buy yourself time, Stain interrupts, sounding a bit more impatient now, but there's no point in delaying the inevitable. So unless you really do intend to fight me yourself, I suggest, you run along. Midraya kun Ida's watery, fearful eyes meet his own as he croaks, go. The edge of Stain's sword dips dangerously close to his face. In a split second, his Yuku's mind is made for him. He moves without thinking. Hearing his footsteps slapping against the gravel, Stain whirls around, looking surprised that his Yuku is actually approaching him. As soon as his back is turned, his Yuku sees Totoraki appear at the other end of the alley. Their gazes lock and his Yuku ducks to avoid the stream of fire Totoraki sends at Stain's back. The hero killer barely manages to dodge and a moment later Totoraki uses his eyes to slide his Yuku, native, and Ida over to him. Totoraki-kun. Ida exclaims. Midraya-kun, you need to give more details in a time like this, Totoraki says, not taking his eyes off of Stain as he pockets his phone. You made me late. His Yuku is so relieved he feels like he could cry. Thank you. See to Ida Kun's wounds, Totoraki orders, and call for more pros. Right. His Yuku crawls over to Ida, struggling not to slip on Totoraki's ice as he reaches his friend's side. Midraya Kun, Ida starts to say. Shut up. His Yuku takes off his gloves and presses his hands to the wound on the other boy's shoulder. I'm not running away. To his confusion, even when he heals his wounds, Ida still can't move. I don't understand. What's wrong? Are you at his quirk? Ida struggles. Totoraki-kun, don't let him as Yuku looks up just in time to see Stain throw a knife at Totoraki's face, grazing his cheek. Totoraki curses and suddenly Stain is right in front, of them, dagger in hand. You have good friends, Ingenium. He sneers, swinging his knife only for Totoraki to block his attack with a wall of ice. He grabs Totoraki's shirt with his other hand and tugs him forward, long tongue darting towards his cheek, but is forced to jump away when Totoraki ignites his left side. That was close. The bicolored boy says, it's blood, isn't it? His quirk, activates by ingesting blood? He sends another wave of ice at Stain, but the villain dodges and slices through it with his sword, sending smaller chunks everywhere. Meanwhile. His Yuku struggles to tug Ida's upper body into his arms. He doesn't want to leave Totoraki alone, especially with natives still unconscious, but maybe if he could get the two out of here then Totoraki will be able to fight, easier. Come on, Ida-kun, his Yuku grunts, glancing at the entrance of the alley nearby and wondering how to carry his much larger friend. Let's why. Ida's whisper distracts him, why are you two? Please stop. I've inherited my brother's name. I have to do it. That guy's mine. His Yuku feels a flare of frustrated anger, but Totoraki saves him from retorting by saying, You inherited it? That's strange. 
His voice is calm, even as he sends another wave of ice at Stain. The Ingenium I saw before didn't have that face, though. You've got a lot going on behind the scenes in your family too, huh? Izuku stares at him, then tenses up when Stain breaks through the wall of ice. To block your own view against an opponent that's faster than you, he growls. What a foolish plan. Totoraki, ignites his left side, only to cry out in pain when two throwing knives plunge into his forearm. Totoraki-kun. Izuku exclaims. Distracted by his pain, Totoraki doesn't look up in time to see Stain leaping towards him with his sword, but Izuku does. He drops Ida in favor of lunging at Totoraki, wrapping his arms around his middle and knocking him aside. Unfortunately, instead of slicing, Totoraki's shoulder, Stain's sword ends up coming down on Izuku's leg. He screams and kicks out, knocking the sword out of Stain's hands before he collapses on the ground next to Totoraki. Midraya kun Totoraki turns to him in concern as he sits up, then hastily sends a stream of fire at Stain when the villain turns to Ida once more, a new sword in hand. He gets to his feet and continues forcing Stain back as Izuku leans himself against the wall, examining his injury. The cut in his calf is deep and painful, but all he can think right now is that he can no longer heal anyone. Totoraki still has the throwing knives in his arm and Ida is still paralyzed for whatever reason and Native is bleeding heavily. The horrible feeling of helplessness rises in his throat again, but the light, of Totoraki's flames burns his retinas as he watches his friend fight for his for their lives, and he finds himself forcing the feeling right back down. No, no, he will not let himself become useless once more. Not this time. Not when his friends could die at any moment. There has to be something he can do, something, something, something his eyes land on the chunks of ice scattered around the alley floor and the light bulb goes off in his mind. Stain starting to force Totoraki towards the opening of the alley, getting dangerously close to Ida and Native, who Totoraki just barely manages to protect with his long-distance attacks. He can't keep this up forever, though he's bleeding and tired and clearly outmatched. Stain forces him to dodge yet another blade thrown at him, and while the boy is distracted he turns towards Ida, raising his sword to deliver a killing blow and slam. The hero killer stumbles when a chunk of ice collides with the back of his head. Stunned, he glances over his shoulder at his Yuku, but he doesn't have time to say anything before Totoraki sends a stream of fire at him. He dodges, but at the same time his Yuku throws another chunk of ice at him, this time hitting him in the back. His head whips around. You, little flames fly towards him and he jumps out of the way. They manage to fend him off this way for a few minutes, keeping Stain between them as Totoraki attacks from the front and Izuku from the back. Izuku doesn't have incredible aim, but he can at least force Stain to dodge, which keeps him from turning on Ida and Native who are still too close to him. Meanwhile, Ida is pleading for them to, stop. Please. He whispers, please stop. I'm, already. Gritting his teeth, Totoraki yells. If you want us to stop, then stand up. Look properly at what you want to be. Stain breaks through one of his ice walls again, forcing Totoraki backwards once more, but at this point he seems to realize that he's getting nowhere being stuck in between Totoraki and his Yuku. In a swift movement, he throws a knife at Totoraki with one hand and with the other, he uses the flat of his sword to parry the chunk of ice as Yuku aims at the back of his head sending it flying back to the boy. Izuku, who was in the midst of reaching for more ice to throw, only has time to look up in surprise before the chunk hits him in the face. Pain explodes in his temple and his vision blurs briefly. He barely sees, Stain backflip towards him, but he does hear the man's heavy boots land behind him and he most certainly feels himself being grabbed and yanked upwards. A long, slimy, Disgusting tongue licks his temple and the next moment he goes limp. Midraya kun Totoraki raises his left hand, but freezes when a dagger is pressed against Izuku's stomach. Enough. Stain snarls next to Izuku's ear. No matter how hard the boy tries, he can't make his body move. 
Totoraki was right, Stain's quirk does activate through ingesting blood. He feels paralyzed, but even so, Stain still holds him in a vice grip, a muscled arm wrapped around his torso, pinning his arms to his sides while a knife presses against his stomach. Don't do anything foolish, boy, Stain warns Totoraki, who glares, I don't approve of, killing innocent people, but I won't hesitate to end this boy's life if you force my hand. Totoraki snarls wordlessly, but when Stain presses the blade a bit deeper, making his yuka whimper, he reluctantly lets his flames go out. A tense silence fills the alley. Despite his steady tone, Izuku can feel Stain's muscles trembling with exhaustion. His heart thuds rapidly against Izuku's back. Taking, Izuku hostage might have actually been a move made out of desperation. Growling, Stain spits, now look at what you've made me do. Harming a healer is a low move, even for villains. See, they don't save people for the glory of it but you. You'll never be anything more than a fake who prioritizes his own selfish desires. Just like your father. Totoraki bares his teeth and the grip on his yuku, tightens. You are a cancer to a society that warps the idea of heroes. Someone must set you straight. You're an archaic fundamentalist, Totoraki says. Then, for the briefest second, his eyes flicker to the side before focusing on Stain again. I won't listen to the logic of a murderer. Of course you won't. Stain hisses, that's exactly why I will he's interrupted by a loud cry of, recipro burst. Stain's head suddenly jolts forward, his chin grazing as Yuku's curls. His chest hits as Yuku's back, causing them both to pitch forward and fall to the ground. As Yuku hits the ground first and is squashed by Stain's body a moment later, but all he can focus on is the pain that suddenly explodes on his flank. Midraya kun Ida shouts and Stain's way disappears off him, but his Yuku, still can't move thanks to the villain's quirk. He hears Totoraki's flames roar above him and he struggles to turn his head, peering out of one eye and seeing Totoraki and Ida both relentlessly attacking Stain whose movements are significantly more sluggish. Ida must have gotten up behind them while Stain was holding his Yuku hostage and sent that recipro burst to the back of his head. The villain, is clearly dazed, but that makes his fighting all the more desperate. His Yuku can see he's making more mistakes now. After a few minutes of dodging and throwing knives, Stain stumbles long enough for Totoraki's eyes to freeze one of his legs. The fight ends not long after that with Ida taking Stain down with a flurry of Recipro burst powered kicks. When the hero killer finally collapses, they all, just stare at his crumpled form for a few moments. He's probably knocked out. Right? Ida pants. Let's restrain him and get out onto the street, Totoraki says, glancing around for something to bind him with. Meanwhile, Izuku struggles not to whimper in pain, his left flank feeling like it's on fire. Blood steadily pools beneath him and he croaks, uh, gee guys? They both turn around, their eyes, simultaneously widening at the sight of blood. Midraya kun. Ida drops to his knees beside him and carefully turns him over. Now as Yuku groans in pain. A knife slides into the pool of blood on the ground and Ida gasps in shock. His his stomach. Stain had a knife pressed against him, Totoraki says kneeling on Izuku's other side so he can keep an eye on the unconscious villain. You couldn't, see it because he had his back turned to you. Ida's eyes fill with guilt. Mimidraya kun, I. Kids, a voice grunts and, after a few moments of shuffling, Nada's face enters Izuku's field of vision. His eyes land on the injury and he hisses, crap. It's alright. Izuku grimaces but is surprised when his arm twitches when he tries to move it. Huh? I can move again? I don't understand, Native frowns. I was down for so long. Izuku shakes his head. Doesn't matter right now. Help me sit up, I need to look at my wound. Totoraki helps him lean up against Hida, who holds him steady as he presses down on his flank. The pain is unbearable, especially now that the adrenaline has worn off but he can tell that it's not too bad. It's just a graze, he grunts, his arm got jostled, I, 
think, when Nia Kun kicked him, so he didn't stab me. I just got grazed when I fell on the knife. He carefully feels around with his fingers, trying to gauge how deep the gash right under his left rib cage is. It's fairly deep, considering that he had Stain's weight pressing down on him when he fell on the knife, so he does his best to put pressure on it. Blood still leaks through his fingers, can't someone get the gauze out of my bag? He asks weakly, help me wrap up my leg and oh, Totoraki kun. He recalls the knives and the boy's forearm and frowns when he sees them missing. You shouldn't have taken them out, you are going to bleed more. Totoraki looks like he doesn't know whether to feel fond or frustrated. Midraya kun, please, worry about yourself for once. I can help patch, you up. Native says, reaching for the bags on his Yuku's belt, all heroes get some basic medical training. Totoraki nods. I'll restrain Stain, then. He gets up to look for something to tie him up with. Be sure to remove his weapons too, Native calls out, unraveling the gauze and giving some to his Yuku to press against his stomach. As he starts wrapping up his Yuku's leg, the freckled boy stifles a groan and leans his head back against Tita's chest. He's never been more exhausted in his life. After a few minutes of silence, Native asks, so you're really a healer, then? Izuku blinks tiredly. Yeah. Well I'm training. Native smiles softly. You're really brave. Then, keep the pressure on. Izuku's hand had gone a bit slack from his exhaustion. A larger, stronger hand slides over his, pressing more firmly against his wound. Ida Kun? The blue-haired boy has been uncharacteristically quiet for the past few minutes, but now as Yuku can hear his hitching breath behind him. I'm sorry, he whispers, too. To have my friends. To have a healer bleed for me. As Yuku presses his lips together. Now that the panic has died down a bit, he actually finds himself rather mad at Ida for actively seeking out the hero killer. It was an incredibly stupid and dangerous thing for him to do. If Izuku had found him only a moment later, he would have been dead and just that thought makes Izuku feel dizzy. So for now, all he says is, later, Ida kun Later. Ida falls silent. Native glances between them and says, hey, if you're not injured, why don't you carry your friend while I help, take care of the villain? Of course, Ida says, carefully scooping up his Yuku into his arms. Native and Totoraki make quick work of restraining Stain, who has yet to regain consciousness, and together they all make their way out of the alley. Soon after they step out onto the street, a group of sidekicks approach them. Children? One asks, bewildered. Those injuries look serious. Another, exclaims, somebody call for a healer. This is a healer. Totoraki says, nodding at his Yuku, and he's too injured to heal anymore. The heroes look even more shocked. His Yuku winces. I'm an apprentice, but my mentor got injured during the initial attack. Shit, this is bad. One woman hisses, then her eyes widen when she spots Stain. Is is that? The hero killer. What? Call the police, and an ambulance. As they wait for said ambulance, most of the heroes stand guard around Stain while the rest fuss over the trio. They ask about their injuries, his Yuku's, of course, being the worst out of the three. Ida only has a few minor scrapes and bruises from the end of the fight, all of his initial wounds having been healed by his Yuku earlier. Even as more time passes, his arms never waver, as they carry his Yuku. The Greenette, however, can see the turmoil swirling in his eyes. You too, he says, glancing between Totoraki and his Yuku. He bows his head. You were injured because of me. I am so. So sorry. I. I couldn't see anything through my anger. Even though his head is bowed, his Yuku can see the tears in his eyes clearly. His heart aches. I'm sorry too, he says, even though I knew you were in pain, I couldn't do anything to help you. Lifting his hand from his side, he presses it against Hida's chest and says, I'll heal your brother as soon as I can. I promise. I won't let Stain take your hero away from you. Ida's breath hitches and he squeezes his eyes shut. 
The tears finally fall. Totoraki shifts awkwardly and says, Pull yourself together. You're crying all over Madraya-kun. I'm sorry, Ida, sniffles, rubbing his face against his shoulder to wipe away his tears. Izuku smiles, feeling just a bit lighter, and snuggles deeper against Ida's chest. It's surprisingly comfortable, even with the armor. Of course, his comfort is short-lived. A cry of alarm is the only warning he gets before he suddenly being snatched out of Ida's arms, a massive wing knocking the boy aside. He shrieks as, claws dig into the gash on his flank, nearly passing out from the pain as he's carried higher and higher into the sky. Midraya kun He can barely hear Totoraki's scream with the wind whipping past his ears. It takes a few moments for Izuku to realize that he's being carried by the same Namu that attacked his ambulance, but by the time he does, the beast suddenly shudders and starts falling. An arm wraps around Izuku's torso, holding him steady and preventing him from getting injured as the Namu hits the ground. A familiar knife delivers a killing blow to the Namu's exposed brain. This is all. Stain rasps, to create a more just society. Izuku panics, but Stain keeps him pinned with a large hand on his back. Let me go. He grunts in pain as his wounds are aggravated. Stain pays him. No mind, breath rattling in his chest as he glances over his shoulder. Endeavor, he hisses. Izuku struggles to turn his head and sees that the flame hero has joined the group of heroes. Still, Stain doesn't back down. Instead, he lets go of Izuku and turns to face Endeavor. You fake. He growls. The utter hatred in his voice is enough to make everyone pause. Even though Stain's hand is no longer pressing him down, Izuku still feels pinned. I must make things right. Someone must be dyed in blood. I must take back what it means to be a hero. Taking a heavy step forward, he snarls, Come. Try and get me, you fakes. The only one I'll let kill me is the true hero. All Might. For a good few moments, everyone is paralyzed by the weight of his conviction. But as soon as it started, it's over. Stain falls unconscious. All anyone can do is stare. Totoraki is the first to break out of his stupor. Midraya kun He starts to rush over. But Native stops him, telling him to wait until the heroes wrangle Stain. Endeavor does so, along with a couple of sidekicks, but he seems displeased. When he approaches, he glances at Izuku with some emotion that almost looks like concern, although, it's more likely he's just taking note of his injuries before he turns his attention to the hero killer. A sidekick helps Izuku limp his way over to the ambulance that arrives moments later, and with that he, Totoraki, Ida, and Native are carted off to the nearest hospital. What was already a long night turns even longer. Izuku ends up needing a minor blood transfusion in addition to his stitches, due to the amount of blood he's lost by the time he reaches the hospital. Inko, of course, gets notified about his 